Oh, and hear us. Yes, sir. All right. Let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, we might see some trickles in here, but we I'm sure we have a lot of stuff to cover. And so um, welcome to um, what we're calling our mine or monitoring expo. And so for the morning, we're going to be covering mining specifically. And in the afternoon, we're going to be covering infrastructure and construction. So um, uh, we have Roland here with us, Roland Chen. Uh, and I'm sorry, the, his associate, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Okay, awesome. Are you guys both going to be presenting today, I assume? I'm presenting the bulk of the mind monitoring stuff, and then Patrick's taking most of the construction in the afternoon. Okay, cool. Gotcha. How do you pronounce your? Apexha. Apexha. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, thanks everybody for coming, for joining in person and, and virtually. I think there's actually few enough of us that we can do a round of introductions. Maybe treat this more as a, a round table instead of yeah. a, a whole presentation deck. Um, I'm happy to go through slides and, and present, but I think it's always more fun to kind of talk to everybody in person and virtually and kind of learn what's going on. Um, do you want to kick us off for everybody yep. virtually? I think we know each other, but I'm Steve Hunter with Rio Tinto and the uh, surveyor at Tailings. Perfect. And before you were in the pit. Yeah, and before that, I was up at the, the mine for 16 years. Steve, is there anything specific that you would like to see or questions you want answered today? I just want to stay up on because technology is always changing, so I was trying to stay in the loop and uh, make sure I share that information with other people, like my co-workers and stuff. Perfect. Awesome. Fred, we just started the intro. Do you want to take up through uh, who you are and then what you do? Yeah, I'm Fred Hatcher with DOD Construction at Reno. Um, I'm, I'm their engineer. I do mostly bridge stuff engineering-wise, routine wall stuff, uh, survey-wise. I kind of lead the group of guys that does all the grade setting and model building and surveying. And I've actually used this system once before about four years ago to monitor a bridge that we built on a cliff side. It's actually the picture that was on the brochure that they had at the last. I was going to say, I, I've heard your name before. I, I thought it sounded familiar. Yeah, so you must work with Dallas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, oh, it's good to, so, good to meet you. That's why I'm here. So you're from <laughs> QD Reno? Yeah. And you flew in for this? Yeah. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So did you guys have like a 30 day license of, T of T4D or something you know, like that? We had here for another project, which is a little bridge in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Black ground, nothing exciting, but we had to monitor it, so we used it again. It makes it exciting, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I, Dallas and I worked the same job and sport for a bunch of years, and I would travel like like every week or every two weeks, whatever, like all the time, all year to like the worst places. And then every once in a while, he'd be like, because he'd got kids at home. And so he'd stay at home, except when it was like Tahoe, Alaska, like all the fun <laughs> places. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> um, I'll kick it to some of the people online too. I don't know if anybody wants to take the initiative and, and say hello and, and introduce themselves. I got Sean Ireland would be first for on my list. Sean, do you want to unmute and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Sean Ireland. I'm the construction project manager for Meridian Engineering here in Salt Lake area. And, and Sean, when uh, when Steve and Fred were talking, could you hear them OK earlier? Yeah. Awesome. OK. Next, we would have Brandon Knight. Yeah, Brandon Knight, Granite Construction. I'm just the survey manager. Happy to be on the call today. Thanks, Brandon. And next we would have Steve Lloyd. Yep. Hello, Steve Lloyd, uh, also from Granite Construction. I've done a lot of monitoring projects, so just kind of interested to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, next we would probably have Scott Haskew. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Scott Haskew. I'm the Mine surveyor out here at MP Materials. We're an open pit mine uh, mining. Uh, log on here to see if there's anything that can help us out here at this mine. 
Scott, are you guys currently doing any monitoring at your mine? Yeah, it's just prisms right now is all we're doing. Gotcha. Uh, next, we would have Sean Ireland. Or no, we already did Sean, sorry. And I guess that is it other than Monson personnel. I think Allison. Oh, Hal. Sorry, Hal. Are you there? Yeah, this is Hal Marshall at UELS Infernal. We do en energy industry. We monitor slips and and roads and mo uh, pads and stuff like that. Thanks for being here, Hal. Uh, we also have Jessica Fredericks. Yeah, Jessica, hi. can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, I work with Rio Tinto as an engineer in the remote operated vehicle group up at the Kennecott mine. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. That's going to be fun. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, Jessica, is there any questions that you wanted to get answered today? Um, I had a few just in regards to the base stations that we have up at the mine. Nothing specific, but just keen to learn more about it. Okay, awesome. Thanks for being here. And then we just better had Ryan show up with Foresight. So we're just going around and doing a little intro and thanks for making it here. So I'm sure you encountered some weather on the way. <laughs> Ryan's from uh, Logan. So he works for Foresight, which is a land surveying firm in Logan. Gotcha. Well, thanks for coming. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to make sure that we cover or any questions that you have for uh, this this session? Okay. Are you going to be here just for the morning or for the whole day? Oh, for the whole day. All right. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, sweet. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, it's good to hear so many people from from I guess diverse uh, backgrounds, not just the mine but construction and, and surveying side too. So appreciate it. And everybody online and and in person braving the weather and <laughs> set some time apart. Um, so today, uh, this morning, we're going to keep it uh, very focused on the mining, and then in the afternoon we'll split and do more of that construction and infrastructure side, particularly kind of on the on the rail side. But we can split out and do whatever anybody really wants to talk about. Um, so I have a, a rough agenda for us going through monitoring and mining, and really where it's used and what technology we have for it, and then splitting off a little bit and going into the underground world. So showing what tools we have in the underground survey world, kind of what it's used for, it, and a little bit of background there. And I also want to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess solutions and systems we have outside of just monitoring and underground survey and, and kind of total stations, but also looking at some of the more, uh, I guess, specialty applications like mobile mapping and scanning and, and potential kind of partnerships and other integrations and things that you guys might see as value in the mining space. Because uh, we're looking to do a lot of, of kind of development and, and rejuvenation to the way Trimble does mining. And so based on everybody's feedback, we'll do a lot of, of I guess, new guided workflows and things like that. So. Um, at any point, feel free, please interrupt. Uh, this would be a lot more fun as a, a discussion and not just a, a bunch of slides or an agenda. So any questions, just feel free to raise your hand or if you're online, just start talking and we'll we'll stop and address it and, and go from there. So yeah, I'll also be monitoring the chat as well. So if you guys want to use that, I'll I'll ping Roland. Mm -hmm. So make sure that we get your questions answered if you want to do it that way. And we are scheduled for nine to noon, um, but I'll try to get us out of here a little bit quicker. I think three hours of slides and discussion can be quite a bit. So. Try to go through the mining stuff, take a break, be underground, and then do a little bit of demo, and hopefully be out of your by 11 or so. So we'll kind of start with the very basics of, of monitoring. And I know a lot of you guys have experience with monitoring, but I think it's worth covering the what's behind it and just kind of how we think about it in the, the world of Trimble and geospatial and, and geotechnical. Because monitoring can monitoring can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. And so just kind of focusing on, on what it is we're talking about in the first place, and then we'll go into the kind of the whys and the hows and how we actually make it happen. Um, so as I said, when you talk about monitoring, there's a million different things you can say about it. There is, even if you just look at monitoring high wall, there's the automated side and the semi-automated side, the manual side. You can use geotechnical sensors or geodetic sensors. If you're underground, you'd love to talk about specific, specific convergence. You can even do monitoring on like machines themselves and monitor things like tire wear and all different stuff. So depending who you talk to, monitoring means a very different thing. Uh, for us, all it really means is measuring that change over time. And so the whole idea is that we're taking a set of sensors and installing them in the field. And just having them run over and over and over again to watch that change and help it see how it develops kind of over over time. Another way to kind of think about it is that measuring kind of what we think about in that standard survey world or that geotechnical world, measuring is kind of done that static environment 
where monitoring is done in that dynamic environment. So we expect things to change. We, we expect there to be some sort of shift on site, and that's why we deploy these sensors and have questions about what that might mean. In the surveying world, what that really looks like is, is you have this region of influence, and I guess it doesn't be survey, it can be uh, geotechnical and engineering and, and really anything. But the way that it typically works is that there's this region of influence, and we set up sensors to measure it. With a total station setup, it's going to be your total station, measuring backsides outside of this region of influence, and then measuring all these monitoring targets inside of that zone. Uh, the monitoring targets uh, with a total station are going to be those prism deployments, so measuring something that's actually centering and moving and, and changing with that condition. You can also add in other sensors like GNSS and geotechnical sensors and, and manual sensors, and whatever, really whatever it takes to measure that, that area. Um, and we covered it a little bit in the introduction, but uh, who has experience with monitoring? And I guess what have you guys been doing in the past uh, in, in monitoring world? That's if you're not railroads, yeah. Uh, highways. Mm -hmm. um, Always with, with manual or automated or a combination? Um, and so you're just measuring points based on historical coordinates and seeing what the change is. And how often were you doing those measurements? Uh, we're able to do it by three times a week or something. Okay. Oh, wow. What about, did you say mining too? No, no mining. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And you've been in the modern world too. Uh, it's more of the geotech side, mm -hmm. but yeah, we have uh, that counts. several uh, total base stations mm -hmm. in our skybox. Then we have a couple radars. We have some IBISs. I think there's nine of them or so. A lot of coverage and stuff. Yeah. And then uh, we also go out and do monuments and other stuff like that just over there by the new crusher. Gotcha. So you have the big automated system, and your server is going out manually measuring these other points kind of uh, online. But it's for certain projects and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense. And Fred, you had a bunch of bridge projects. Yeah. Aside from the one or the two jobs we use the T4D with, mm -hmm. everything else has been total station prism. And just manual measurements and. Yeah. And I think I heard somebody online had some monitoring experience at, at a mine with with prisms. Was that was that manual or, or automated? Oh uh, yeah, that's manual right now. Uh, it's okay. just within that six. Gotcha. Cool. Well, it's good to hear you guys have have experience with it. So a lot of this maybe will be new in terms of of what we have and, and what we've been using. Uh, but if you have any questions, before you're up to, we can you can take a deep dive into anything that you guys want to see. Um, so next, I'll kind of cover where where we typically see monitoring used in the mining world, and then what we have that can kind of go along and complement uh, those systems, and not just looking at the standard Trimble total station prisms, but what else we have in the, in the monitoring space that can help supplement the the data sets. Um, I think it's also worth covering why monitoring is typically used, or not typically used, but why monitoring is used in the mining space. Uh, there's three main reasons that we've seen over over the years. Um, a big one is always going to be safety, and this is safety of the people in the mine and also the safety of the mine itself and assets that go along with it. Uh, if you're not monitoring something and you're not monitoring it effectively, it's, it's a huge unknown and you can't really safely operate in it. And I know safety is a priority for, for basically everybody on a mine site, so that's a, the biggest guiding factor we have around mm -hmm. these monitoring systems. A lot of times the data from the total stations can, can be combined with like geotechnical data and sometimes with something like a radar. And you can oftentimes prevent, uh, predict and prevent a lot of these major failures. And maybe you can't prevent the high wall from collapsing, but you can prevent a lot of, of um, I guess, the associated costs with it. So you can get stuff and people out of the mines, uh, out of that pit, clear that area. You can work more effectively because you know generally when that's going to happen. So you can keep people in the pit for longer and pull them out safely without worrying about not knowing how it's moving. And so that's really the, the biggest reason we see, see monitoring used in the mining space. Another one is that operational efficiency. And so as you're saying, you guys are, are pushing the, the pit at, at the kind of combine super, super steep uh, to get more out of the earth, I'd imagine. That's probably the guiding factors is the extraction there. Uh, and if you're not monitoring effectively, you can't really push that limit safely. Uh, and if you're not monitoring effectively, you can't even, even really operate at a safe level effectively. And so when you have these monitoring systems, then you can, can operate a lot more efficiently, dig a little bit steeper, dig a little bit deeper, and just extract a whole lot more from the earth itself. Um, Another big reason we see monitoring done is on the regulation side. Uh, and this maybe has more to do with the, the safety and the environmental aspects that go along with the mine. Um, mining is interesting, at least to me, and in a lot of ways because there's a lot of um, stigma around it just in the public eye with how, how seemingly dirty and unsafe and everything it can be. 
But the more I've worked in mines, the more I've, I've learned how everybody's focused on making mines sustainable and operate well and be safe and be, you know, not just this big evil thing that, that digs out of the ground, but is providing some sort of resource that we can use for the electrification of the world and, and a lot of these environmental pushes. So it's really interesting to see that a lot of the regulation around mining is actually guided by the people in the mines because they're so far ahead of that, that regulation curve that they're using technology effectively, being safe and being environmental and, and operating that way. So it's kind of just, it's cool to see the, the regulation following a lot of the best practices that come out of what mines are already doing. So hopefully you guys find the same thing and you're using technology and, and trying to, to kind of drive um, how the mines operate and operate in a more safe and more environmental way. It's, it's cool to see. Um, what it boils down to in mining for monitoring is really uh, the monitoring data being used for two main functions. One is risk management and the other is that informed decision making. So you're taking that data from the monitoring system and you're making sure things are safe and you're also making sure that it guides uh, where the mine goes, where it's being dug steeper and deeper and, and where it's being uh, kind of pushed a little bit farther. And so the, the data is really used for those two main core, core functions. In terms of where we see monitoring used on, on the mines itself, uh, we really see them in the open pit, uh, on the tails, and in the underground uh, kind, of, kind of workflows. So in the open pit, we really see uh, monitoring used primarily for the slope stability, which makes sense because that's the, the highest risk and the main function of the pit is to be a big hole. And so make sure the slopes stay stable uh, and we know what's happening to them. On the tailings dams, the monitoring becomes much more diverse because every tailings dam is going to have different questions that they need answered. Sometimes the, the dams are built, um, uh, I would say, quickly and steeply. And so they're not always the, the most stable structures, but sometimes the dams are the most stable piece of, of that, that mine. And so you're monitoring for completely different, uh, different parameters. So we have a lot of different sensors that can go in the tailings dam, and, and each, each system tends to be a little bit more uh, bespoke. Uh, in the underground world, it's not necessarily monitoring in the, in the way that we think about an automated total station or automated geotechnical sensors. Uh, but it is monitoring in the way that you are going down and consistently scanning or measuring and doing control uh, and kind of seeing the convergence of, of those areas and monitoring not just the structure, but also the, the material that comes out of that ground and out of the earth and monitoring for kind of extraction and, and yields and all that. Uh, in terms of what to monitor, uh, that's really going to depend on every single uh, scenario, right? Every scenario is going to be a little bit unique. No mine is the same and really no, no, um, no area in a mine is the same too. So when it comes to what to monitor, you have to ask yourself uh, what questions do you want to answer? And then answer those questions with, with the data to back it up. Uh, monitoring data can be used to help uh, guide how you decide if something's risky or not risky. It can help guide your decisions, but it's never going to be the, the be all end all. So the monitoring system can back up whatever, whatever missions that you have and whatever questions you want to answer, but it's not going to give you the, the I guess that magic bullet, that magic data set that's going to let you just do anything, anything that you want. So every good monitoring system starts with with good questions, and then we we try to answer those through data and through through uh, those focus workflows. Uh, on the open pit and stability side, uh, typically what we see is is um, different parameters being measured. So typically what we see is the high wall movement is being measured, and we really use the total stations and the monitoring system. Trimble for that kind of long-term high precision settlement. There's kind of a, a few ways that slopes move. A lot of times they they creep over time and settle over, you know, months and weeks and years at a time. And then as the movement starts to increase, then the movements get bigger and bigger and bigger and kind of accelerates. So it's kind of a, a two-pronged approach where the total stations are used, uh, even if if we suspect everything's totally fine. And you record that data over a long time. You you record the trends, kind of understand how things are moving and behaving and how the velocity changes. And based on that, you can kind of predict when things will become uh, more and more severe. And then we combine it with other technologies that can measure faster, like radar and GNSS, to kind of give you a better idea of, of how things are evolving quickly. Combine those data sets together, and then you can really effectively predict kind of what's going to happen. Um, with the high wall, a lot of times it can also be important to measure the surrounding area. Uh, so even just the area above and around the pit, uh, it might not be as crucial as the actual stability of the slope, but having a survey go out and measure other structures around that site a lot of times can be integrated with that data and kind of give a holistic big picture of what's happening. Um, there's also other parameters that we can measure with the open pit stability itself. Uh, a lot of times we're digging into the water table and you want to measure the actual groundwater uh, and water content of the slopes uh, in particular areas or just over the entire uh, uh, structure. And so we can add in other sensors like piezometers and IPIs and inclinometers and, and uh, 
even like borehole extensometers and stuff like that. So a big, um, I guess, slew of sensors you can throw at it. Um, as you're saying too, a lot of times the open pits can be so big and so steep that they have their own weather. Uh, and so having local weather stations there can really help, um, I guess, understand the, the weather that's happening, if there's going to be rain or temperature change or any sort of drastic weather events. Uh, but a lot of the times it can also be used for things like film station corrections and making sure other data sets are, are more effective. So having a system that integrates everything together could be super important. Um, do you guys see a lot of seismic influence on things like like tailings, dams, and open pits in, in Utah, Nevada? When we do a lot of blasting and set up seismographs, see if we wonder how much mm -hmm. energy is going into the high wall and stuff. So that makes sense. And is that vibration or is that seismic? Uh, I That's who you they, ask. I don't know. I think it's both. Okay. They, they. I know that the engineers go out there and put them where they think. Cool. And that's that's kind of done as needed for blasting. Is sometimes uh, when, yeah, where we try different products and other stuff to see how it affects the walls and stuff, and mm -hmm. maybe they try a new design, trying to pull the energy out of from the wall. Oh, without digging. Have in hard spots, you know. right? Cool, makes sense. Makes sense. If you fracture the wall too much, you're going to cause more, more failures damage. and stuff. So yeah, always walking that fine line. Yeah, <laughs> so you keep tweaking it, always learning. Sure. Um, in terms of kind of the typical sensors that we see in open pits, the biggest one is going to be things like total stations and radar. So those big optical sensors. Uh, because they do a really, really fantastic job of measuring typically over a long range uh, and really high precision. So a single total station can measure, you know, once every few hours and can measure one, two, three hundred prisms at a time and give you really precise uh, movement data on kind of those discrete points. Um, the total stations range anywhere from 10 to 2500 meters and they're kind of configurable. What we found is that uh, any any total station that's installed on a mine site, you're going to be pushing that that range kind of to the limit. And the data integrity falls off a little bit past uh, a thousand meters or so. And so it almost doesn't matter what total station you're using in terms of, of accuracy specs and range specs, because if you're looking for really precise data, uh, everything falls off at about a thousand meters. We spec in the long range gun with the highest precision and just kind of hope that the, the atmosphere works out. Sometimes you get good data and sometimes you get bad data. Um, when we're out visiting you guys at, at Kennecott, what I realized too is, is a lot of times you don't need that 3D discrete point. You just want a, a one dimensional movement in or out of the wall. And so there's ways in the system that we can we can essentially trick it to not try to take a 3D measurement, but try to just do that longer range one dimensional measurement and push that range a little bit. But then it's the trade off always of that data quality with with um, with that range. So it's kind of a uh, maybe more of a, a custom <laughs> solution of a yeah. uh, But there's ways that we can get good data out of it. Uh, we also see GNSS being used a lot um, in the open pit. Um, and GNSS can be used for, for, I guess, multiple reasons, right? So one is, is monitoring those, those GNSS antenna themselves in those GPS positions. So you get good coordinates on those and you measure through time and you, and you get good monitoring data from that point itself. But you can also integrate GNSS into other workflows. And so you can have these like multi-purpose monitoring base station or monitoring GNSS stations that can also be used uh, to some extent for like RTK corrections. Uh, and you can use them for your optical kind of backsighting. So the idea is you have this like integrated survey where you can set your GNSS antennas up, measure a prism on them, and then the GNSS antennas give you updated prism coordinates kind of every day or every two days, depending on the processing. So that way, if the whole area is settling and you don't have good line of sight to your back sites, you can still reset off a good coordinate and get that good long-term settlement from the GNSS position without relying on back sites that maybe are shifting and moving and introducing error. So there's there's ways that we can kind of work this system to use all these different uh, sensors for this like multi multi-purpose integrated whole system. Um, on the radar side, uh, radar I think goes hand in hand with total station data. Uh, radar is much, much faster than total station. So a total station might take, you know, 15, 20 minutes, or even in, in a lot of applications it could take an hour to run around because there's so many prisms has to measure. Radar can sweep every every few seconds and give you a, a good, quick, one-dimensional view of, of the high wall, but you're not going to get that really precise, discrete movement data on the prisms. So we kind of use them in combination where the, the total stations give you that good settlement data and long-term data, and the radar gives you that really uh, quick kind of last minute alarming on big block movements. And those data sets together let the mining engineers really predict and, and decide what's failing and when it's going to fail. Um, 
I've heard a lot of anecdotes uh, from from people over the years where they're able to predict mine failures to within a couple hours. It's like miraculous. It, it's crazy. It, it is a system that works really, really well. So with the scan, do you mm -hmm. get that data in as like a point cloud or does it come in as like a block or, or the surface? Radar data? Actually, I'm not super familiar with, so I don't know exactly what it's coming in as. It is a surface, but I don't know what the actual deliverable is. If they're pulling out the like points on it and trying to just do like a point to point comparison. Like LIDAR would? Or? Like kind of like LIDAR would. It's it's a really similar so like idea. A, um, is LIDAR used in uh, in this scenario as well? It can be, yeah. And so we see, and we're seeing more and more of these like big long range scanners, so especially Regal, um, has some some really good scanners that can go out to like two, three, four kilometers at a time. Uh, and so we're seeing people kind of trying to decide between uh, LIDAR and radar. Radar is faster than LIDAR. Uh, and so if you need, you know, rapid big block uh, alarming radar probably is is indispensable. But having having that uh, uh, lidar data to back you up and having a better, maybe more uh, precise point cloud, you can do some different deliverables with it and take it like into TBC and actually identify. You know, this is this block, and we can identify some specific mm -hmm. displacements on that. So it's kind of a, a give and take with with the data quality and the data, uh, I guess, speed of, of acquisition. Well, there's probably multiple applications. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You could probably put all four of them in in one, like a, a mine the size of Kennecott. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Do you guys use drones at at Kennecott? Yes. Okay. That's I'd be shocked if uh, that's what Jess is. She's part of the ROV team. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's not. It's not terrestrial. It's it's drones. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. So would the radar then be kind of like quick detection of large movement mm -hmm. is that kind of would that be the idea for something that could sweep so quickly exactly yeah so when something starts to really happen it would pick that up so it's like a comparison of a scan to scan kind of a comparison exactly hmm. yeah. gotcha do you guys use lidar for monitoring uh we do have some idis rate lidar okay. units yeah, there's a lot and it's all tied into our production control so gotcha. when one alarms, they are known of the movements increases and stuff like that. And we have certain areas that are moving more quickly than others. We focus on those and make sure we have. And you guys are using right radar as well too, right? Yeah. Pretty, okay. Yeah. Well, you've got a lot of hot spots hot right spots. now. Yeah. Spring is horrible. Mm -hmm. Oh, everything's melting. It really a lot of water. Who do you use for radar? Uh, I think it's ground probe. Okay. Then the Ibis. Uh, yeah, it's all good. Thanks. Um, on the geotechnical side of, of slope monitoring, as I kind of said before, there's a million different sensors you can install uh, to kind of understand not only how a slope is moving, but kind of why it's moving. Uh, and as you said, a lot of times in the spring, you could probably can get thaw and, and the water contents can change. So do, do you guys use pizos in the high one? Oh, thousands. Yeah. We have a lot. Yeah. Makes sense. So the for those that don't know, visometer just measures uh, yeah. pore pressure yeah. in a geologic layer. And so it's really commonly used to measure groundwater levels and see how that changes. Um, water is one of the biggest influences on, on any Earth movement, so measuring it, it can be really, really important. Um, do you guys use IPIs out there? Uh, we have a whole uh, hydro team, so we're Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so Maybe. sir, we didn't play with it, but uh, hydro, they have all the drilling holes to pump water out. And then they have every time we drill a hole, we try to find something to throw in it, Might water well, something. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. An in place inclinometer. So it's. it's a, yeah, so <laughs> the in place inclinometers is, if you haven't seen it before, it's kind of a specialty sensor. Um, where it's essentially a chain of tilt meters at a fixed segment value. It's and a based chain. on it's a chain, yeah. Okay. So you tie together, you know, tilt meters at every three or four feet. Uh, and then based on the tilt and because you know the segment length, you can calculate a two to displacement down a borehole. And so it's a really good way to measure subsurface movement um, as something changes over time. So that borehole kind of shifts and moves, and you get a displacement on each segment as you go down. You can do this big cumulative displacement thing and see the actual shape of the borehole. So for for big slopes and especially tailings dams and earthen dams, it's a really really effective tool. Um, wow. On the specialty side too, you can use those the seismic of those vibration sensors uh, and and those weather sensors. So we commonly see all these sensors being used kind of separately and independently. But 
but but T4D and software that we have to really pull it all together and put it in one place to make it easier to correlate things together and kind of see what's potentially influencing those movements and where they're coming from and kind of why they happen. Uh, and I, I'm sure you guys pulled together to, to geo explore. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. As long as they're going to the same place, that's the important thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, on tailings, uh, for those that are not familiar with with tailing stamps, uh, and I'm no expert, but I just know what, what tailing stands for. <laughs> so it's a, a tailing storage facility at, at TSF. Uh, consists really of that tailings pond and that tailings dam, and it's really there to hold back a lot of that uh, wastewater, and especially if you're doing heat bleaching, you know, it's there to kind of hold that water in one place. Sometimes they can act as filters, um, and so water can inf infiltrate the dam, Go through these specific filters and they can recycle back into the dam for or excuse me back into the mine for for other use the interesting thing about about that kind of workflow is that the the dam is kind of designed designed to have this water infiltration in there and so there's a ton of water moving through the dam it's kind of inherently going to destabilize the whole thing and and have a lot of potential influence so as that reservoir level changes the whole behavior of the dam is going to change so it's a, a super dynamic environment it's it's really interesting i think tailing stands are one of the coolest pieces of, of the mine um, as I kind of said before, tailings, dams, every every dam is going to have different parameters that you need to measure. Uh, almost all of them, or, or hopefully all of them, are going to measure the, the water that's going through. And it's water in the reservoir, it's water in the dam, and then water in the surrounding areas to kind of make sure it's not leaching into other places and, and affecting um, other potential kind of groundwater areas. Um, you're also going to monitor for the, the dam movement itself, because as that water content changes, that whole dam is going to change shape and, and change behavior. Um, the seismic influence and especially background vibration can be important on, on the dams too. And so the, the seismic and vibration sensors that we use can, can record essentially background behavior. Uh, it's more commonly done on things like, uh, uh, like bridges and big steel structures where you measure kind of the natural harmonics of a structure and you record that background vibration and, and seismic behavior all the time. Uh, maybe once a day you're recording for an hour and just kind of watching how that behaves. And then if those those background frequencies change, it lets you know that there's a change in the structure itself and the harmonics have kind of shifted. So it can be used as kind of an early indicator for not ne necessarily knowing what's wrong, but knowing that something is wrong. And then you deploy other sensors to kind of figure out what's happening with the dam itself and, and how it's changing and why it's being. Um, the typical sensor you use on a, a TSF or a challenge dam, uh, the piezometer is going to be kind of the, the key piece of that. Again, kind of measuring that poor pressure water due to the water saturation in particular layers. Um, in, in T40 and really in the, the data log and geotechnical system that we have, there's there's ways to convert from the actual pore pressure to things like water level, uh, restricted water level, unrestricted water level. So you can do different calculations on that water and really try to figure out what's happening in that layer. Because depending on, on what you're measuring, you're going to want to do a different kind of conversion with it. So if you're measuring a confined layer, you're going to want to keep that as, as pressure or, or water head. If it's an, an unconfined layer, like the actual reservoir level or something, you know, uh, like an artesian well or that's not completely uh, in, in like a sandstone layer, then you're going to want to display that data in a different way than you would with the confined layer. So there's a lot of ways to split that data out uh, and kind of show in a way that makes sense. Um, IPIs, we see a lot of times used in the tailing stamps because they are moving so much and they, they typically, well, I don't want to say they typically as, as like I've worked on a bunch of dams, but a lot of times you can see them uh, start to like creep and move downstream and just kind of walk over time just because there's there's so much happening so the IPI will really let you know where in the dam is is moving um, we also see total stations and and GNSS used to measure the actual surface movement of the dam we had a project in um, down in Mexico where we, we deployed like a dozen or so GNSS antennas on top of the, the crown of the dam to measure for settlement of, of the actual crown and then pair that with things like IPIs and tilt meters and pieces to kind of supplement the, the movement underneath and moving kind of along that, that dam surface. So a lot of different ways that we can get movement data out of, out of a system like that. Um, on the specialty side, uh, sometimes we also see INSAR being used, so like satellite data. Um, I would never use satellite data as a replacement for something like a total station or GNSS that's giving you really precise, discrete measurements on the actual surface of the dam. But INSAR can be really, really helpful for that wide area capture and a lot of times that historic data capture. So especially if you're coming into a situation where your tailings dam maybe is 20 or 30 or 40 years old and you've only started monitoring it in the last decade or so, sometimes you can buy that INSAR data from way back in the day and see that historic change leading up to that point and then use the monitoring data to kind of supplement going forward. Yeah, you can actually capture some moisture. 
Exactly. Yeah. With there's those, with those face scans or whatever you call them. Yeah. There's like multispectral and hyperspectral imagery, so you can do all sorts of crazy analysis on the wavelengths and see, like, yeah, moisture content, mineral content, vegetation, like all mineral, sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Instar data is really, really helpful um, to supplement and and kind of guide. Uh, and then the monitoring data comes in with that really precise uh, kind of ground truth of of what's happening there. So really good, good combo there. How would that be incorporated in T4D uh, imagery? It depends. Like that? Yeah. So uh, T4D is not a, I guess, stellar like GIS and INSAR anal analyzing tool. And so INSAR data is best analyzed outside of T4D and then brought into T4D with that monitoring data. And we typically find that people aren't flying into our data every single day and running the same processing on it. Maybe you're doing it once a month or once a quarter or once a year. And so that you can pull that into our data in essentially as a static image and then overlay your sensors on top of it and kind of show where things are in, in relation to into like the larger structures that are happening. You're just bringing in the image. Essentially, yeah. Um, do you guys use a lot of INSAR data for, for monitoring? You're, you're right in front of me, so I asked. We, uh, we just don't get a cut, like doing it all so yeah we normally do the whole mountain range mm -hmm. but uh i think we do it a couple times a year but again it's we have a lot of clients other engineers that uh, look at the data and stuff but mm -hmm. show where it all goes <laughs> i know we get it because something we have a link yeah i feel it but... <laughs> perfect mm -hmm. um any questions on on the application so far Everything's making sense. Uh, I'm on. I'm on the the right track, and and not just making stuff up. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> sweet, amazing. Um, so next, we'll get kind of into what we have at Trimble that can really help you guys do this monitoring. Uh, and with the mine monitoring, uh, a lot of times what we see is that there's a lot of different integrations and partnerships. And so this is all the stuff that we have available. I think that we have the best tools. We can also integrate with essentially everything that's out there to kind of make one big comprehensive system. We recognize that that people always make tools in different ways. And so if it's going to be like a uh, Geo Explorer, which is a different kind of big software platform that integrates things, there's things that we do better than Geo Explorer and there's things that Geo Explorer does better than us. And just depending on, on what tools you guys are using, you might want to use our toll stations, our data loggers with Geo Explorer or your, some other combination of, of monitoring systems. So we're open to, to kind of any integration out there. That being said, I think the triple stuff is the best stuff out there, <laughs> but, but I'm, a, I'm a little bit biased. Um, in terms of the standard serving workflows, we have everything from we call the, the tripod to the pillar setup. And so not every situation, not every installation is going to need a fully automated total station deploy. A lot of times if you're measuring once every few months or once every few weeks uh, or even once every few days, you don't need a fully automated system. And so we have a, a what we call a semi-automated portfolio that automates all those redundant tasks. And so instead of having to sit there and measure and just go target by target by target and, and then measure it, pilot and put it into a report and kind of generate everything, it does all that for you. So you set it up, it runs and it measures all the same points it did last time, gives you the same reports that it did the first time and, and flags things automatically for you. So it's a huge time saver uh, and it's a really easy tool to use because it's based on triple access and TDC and all the tools that people use every day. It just automates again all those redundant pieces. Um, as those project requirements increase, those things get more risky and that data um, recording frequency needs to go up and up and up, then you look at automation as a way not to you know, replace somebody's job, but to really enable much more data to be collected. And we have an entire automated portfolio that you know, does total station and GNSS, and geotechnical, and all these, these specialty sensors. On the semi-automated side, there's a module in, in Trimble Access called Trimble Access Monitoring, surprise, surprise, uh, that automates all your field data collection and does probably 80 or 90% of what you need out of your deliverables. And so with terminal access monitoring, you can get that field data processing and that field data collection. So it automates that, that survey. You just learn all the targets one time, uh, set it up like you would any other any other survey. And then the next time you go out, you set your tripod up, you run your, your resection to get your, your location and your orientation, and you just hit run you know, any number of rounds forever, how, for however long you want. And it goes and it measures over and over and over again and gives you that data. Out of terminal access, you get uh, displacements right away and some basic charting. And so it's really easy to take that and just put it in an Excel sheet and email it out to whoever needs to see it as a verification that says, you know, monitoring's fine, everything was, was okay. Uh, and it gives you that real-time alarming in there. And so as soon as a surveyor sees something that's out of normal, they can either go back and remeasure it and just verify. And then they know right away, okay, this thing's moved and it's a big deal and I'm right here and it, it's happened. Um, if you need other kind of more in-depth deliverables, there's ways to integrate Trimble Access Monitoring with uh, both the module in TBC uh, and with that fully automated system. 
So with T40, you can have automated toll stations and automated geotechnical sensors and manual sensors. And so you can have people upload and kind of uh, drag and drop files from triple access into T40 and display all the data in one place and do like a file scan and CSV import for monitoring data from total stations or geotech. So it's a big open open platform. Um, on the TVC side, there's a TVC monitoring module that does a really similar thing as Trimble Access, where it's automating all those kind of redundant tasks. And so you tell it what report you want and what your your um, your thresholds are. Uh, you kind of set it up one time, it might take 15 to 20 minutes to just get it dialed in and looking how you want it to look. And then every single time after that, you just drag your data into TVC monitoring and it runs that same report for you based on those, those old settings. And so if somebody's doing a lot of monitoring, uh, it's it's going to be a huge time saver. So if you're just running a project and somebody's going out every few days, this might save them 20, 30 minutes, two times a week. And then over a few weeks, it adds up into, into hours and hours and hours. So it's a huge time saver. It's super easy to use. Uh, if somebody's task involves monitoring regularly, I think it's, there's no reason they shouldn't be using it. But if you're only monitoring once every few months and you get you know good enough data and deliverables out of terminal access, you can just you can just use that and, and be done with it. Uh, TBC monitoring also comes with with um, what what's the the like top level TBC subscription or or edition? I kind of forget my TBC editions. Well, editions. Yeah. That's I mean I would guess I would say TBC advanced, but then you just add the modules on top of that, exactly. like scanning or monitoring. The the monitoring module comes with the TBC advanced subscription. So if you have TBC oh, advanced have the, subscription, you already have the monitoring. So the subscriptions are different. You have oh, okay. uh, a couple right. of different ones. That's right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, it's field and data, and then there's mapping and probably the, the the mapping is the higher one. Mm -hmm. That one that can take uh, you can it has scanning as part of it. Gotcha. So maybe maybe monitoring would be a part of the 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 mapping one. The field that makes sense. I, I knew I knew at one point in my life that I told them. It's a good question though. Yeah, but if you're using TBC regularly, the chances are you have the monitoring module in there um, already. And if you don't, you can get a demo. It's it's a great module. So on the GNSS side, yeah. like I've done, I've used uh, access monitoring with a robot, mm -hmm. uh, but with the GPS, I assume it would be RTK. Um, but do you have static options as well through monitoring in access? The monitoring module is pretty limited with GNSS because the okay. the big benefit that it has is is running the total station and measuring the same points for you. Yeah. If you're doing GNSS serving, you're already going out and measuring those points. Yeah. And so it doesn't add a whole lot of, of value there. So it's really just for. The, Are you doing it in monitoring though when you measure the points? It would still just be in access. Oh. Mm -hmm. In TBC monitoring, you could you could use that GNSS data, but in access monitoring, it's really meant around that total station data collection. Oh. So you right. actually make the GNSS measurements in access, not in monitoring, but then right. in the monitoring app, you reference those points or something like that. You, it says GNSS. So for that might, be, that might be a mistake. OK, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, however, it does it? Yeah. But it looks like you might actually be incorporating it in TVC more so than in the monitoring app. Exactly. Yeah. App. So with TBC, you can like integrate all your GNSS points together and your total station. Data I assume that the, the, the level would be the same way. You're not connecting monitoring in access to a DNI. That's right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So measuring in access, but not necessarily in the, the monitoring module itself. OK. Gotcha. Um, on the automated setup, this is where the sensors get a little bit more exciting than just uh, total stations and the occasional GNSS. The automated sensors you can add in the, the geodetics, so total station and GNSS, but also the geotechnical sensors and the whole specialty sensor. Um, there's also a layer of kind of power and communications that goes along with an automated setup. So anytime your sensors are running 24 seven and being out in the field and, and measuring all the time, you need to add in that layer of, of power and consistent communication to get the data over to the, the software. So on the software side, we have a platform called Trimble 40 controller or T4D for short. And it does it does a few main things really. So one is it does all your data collection and data processing, especially on your total station and, and GNSS side. Uh, but it also takes that data and turns it into a bunch of automated uh, deliverables and alarms and, and visualizations and stuff like that. So there's kind of two main components. There's T40 control that sits in the background and does that survey kind of data processing and, and data integration. And then there's T40 web that sits on top of it. And that's really meant to be an easy to use kind of big web portal that anybody can access. Uh, and they can come in and view the data however they need. They don't have to be a surveyor or a geotechnical engineer. They can look at that data in a way that makes sense. It's a little bit easier to look at. It's already processed for them. And then there's a bunch of automated deliverables too, like those reports and those alarms that can be sent out kind of as needed. 
So T40 Web is really where we take all that complicated monitoring data and turn it into something uh, super usable. Um, can't answer this already, but it sounds like most people here use a combination of, of automated and, and manual data. Uh, has anybody used terminal access monitoring before? Yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the land surveyor out there, or the construction company that has robots that they're it just they're just not monitoring all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, monitoring and through access makes tons of sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Anybody online? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I've traditionally used Trimble SiteWorks for monitoring, and I just mm -hmm. recently switched over to Access. And sorry, Access seems just a lot more uh, user friendly for monitoring. I've been I've been pretty happy with it. Just doing cool. a lot of manual. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear. So, Steve, you're just uh, are you just doing like a point to point comparison over time, or do you stake out? The point that was measured previously and see what the deltas are or yeah so i've got the uh the monitoring module for business center and uh right now i've got a dam project um just monitoring a soil nail wall um and just doing you know daily reports monthly reports depending on construction activity and i just bring that data into monitoring module in tbc and run the report Definitely saves a lot of time compared to doing a uh, Excel spreadsheets by hand. Sure, yes. <laughs> it's funny. It took us. It took Trimble probably like twenty years to improve on Excel. <laughs> we find that like <laughs> it's officially better now. It's officially better. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so as I was kind of saying, the the main functions of T forty really come in more than just that geodetic processing and kind of enabling that automated movement detection, we add in a bunch of, of things on top of it. So the, the four main pieces really is, is that sensor management and the data integration. And especially in these big kind of um, larger systems that we see in the mines, integrating all the, the different data sets into one place is, is super, super important. Um, even if the, the geotechnical guys don't work every day with the surveyors, that data always ends up being delivered together and kind of used in the same way. So having it put together into one portal automatically is, is huge. Um, T40 also has that, that geodetic processing and adjustment that runs in the background. So your surveyors can set that data up, set those total stations up, that set up the GNSS so it's processing and, and being run correctly. And then it's automatically being done for you in the background. You don't really have to worry about um, running those surveys over and over and over again. There's also a lot of, of I guess, data integrity features that go along with that automatic, automatic automated processing, uh, where you can automatically flag um, movements that are larger than what you expect. And those can get rejected from your your data set altogether. That way, if if something happens and like a prism is is moved or damaged somehow, and you you get a bad measurement, then you can automatically flag that, reject it, and not report on it. So you're not sending off all these all these false alarms. Uh, same thing goes if you're running like a um, you know running a system with with five or six backsites, and especially in a big open pit mine, those backsites have a huge influence on the atmospheric correction. So if a few of those backsites drop out, you can get a huge change in the results of of your survey. So T40 can automatically see that happen and flag uh, entire rounds that have like a, a worse data integrity than the previous round and not report in that data. Mm -hmm. um, so that way it's not gonna, you know, all of a sudden if there's a storm and you miss three of your backsides that are being used for this big atmospheric correction, your data shifts and your data changes, all of a sudden that's not a reliable measurement. T40 throws that out for you so you don't have to go in and all of a sudden try to, or try to understand uh, what happened with this round, was it good data, was it bad data? It just kind of does it all for you and makes it so it's a much more, um, I guess easy to trust systems. You're not always flagging these false alarms and trying to figure out what's what's going on. Um, there's also a lot of different visualization and analysis tools. So taking the data from T40 and turning it into something useful for the particular sensor that you're using. A piezometer is going to be very different than than even just the reservoir level is going to be very different than a total station and from seismic sensors and from the from the IPIs. So having a way to build out all these custom reports and charts and analyses that show data in a way that makes sense is going to be super super important. And so you can give access to somebody like a geotechnical engineer to come in and set up these very specific reports to come out. And then those reports come out in a format that makes sense to them every single time. Uh, so there's a lot of different tools you can use to kind of split that data out and make sure it's, it's being shown in a way that is intuitive. There's also a lot of reporting and alarming features that go along with that. So integrating multiple data sets into a single alarm. And so what you can think about is, is something like having a 
you know, a rainfall sensor on your weather station combined with your reservoir level and your your water level inside the, the tailings dam itself. So you can say, I want alarm to go off only if there's a spike in the reservoir level and then the, the conditions in the dam changes. And I only want that if it's due to a rainfall event. So you can have all those, those sensors input into a single alarm, set different thresholds on there and have different logic in there. So you can say and, or if then kind of whatever you need. Uh, and then that alarm is going to go through and evaluate every single time based on your own logic in there. So it's a really good way to have complicated alarm setup, or in a lot of cases, do some some automatic false alarm kind of rejection. So especially on if you have like a, a you know a slope next to the tailings dam that might fail and go into the pond and cause all sorts of havoc, you can have a tilt meter on that slope and a total station measurement on that slope, and say if the tilt meter moves and that prism data moves then that alarm goes off because if that alarm goes off, it's going to set off some really complicated series of, of responses and actions. So you want to make sure that that alarm is only sent out when there's a real movement on there and you can have different data sets and then kind of make sure it's cross checked itself and, and self verified. Uh, in terms of sensor integrations, so we have um, essentially everything you would encounter on, on the mine site. There are some specialty sensors that we maybe don't integrate directly with, like uh, radar, but we always have ways to work with people in the radar space or in other spaces to make sure you guys can get those sensors or that our sensors integrate with the platform that's, that's using it and kind of vice versa. Uh, the things that we have in our portfolio are on the geodetic side, so the total stations and the GMSS. Um, we have a geotechnical system too, so not necessarily the individual sensors you're going to use, but the data logging system and the telemetry system to make sure that data is all recorded and transmitted effectively. And then we also work with a partner for kind of those structural health sensors. So things like weather stations and seismic sensors and vibration sensors. So you can get those all through the guys at, at Monson. Um, on the total station side, uh, it's fairly open. So we can integrate with essentially every Trimble total station out there. And we can do some third party integrations too. So things like, like a total stations and Topcon, we can either import that data or in some cases control that total station with our own kind of setup. Um, but we typically use the, the Trimble, the S series. Uh, the S7 is what we use for most monitoring projects. Uh, on a mine site, we typically see the S9 used because it's higher precision and you can you can upgrade it from a standard range to a long range. So going from about 700 meters to 2,500 meters. And having that long range measurement can be really important with these high level applications where you're measuring from a you know a far away location over an entire open pit. Um, and we can have that discussion around ranges and accuracies and uses kind of on a you know case by case basis. But 2,500 2,500 meters is typically the, the maximum that we see. And it's really what we see as the max for, for that real usable data. So, Roland, so if you had an old robot on there that didn't have, it was a five second gun, mm -hmm. um, do you just put that kind of that metadata into T4D so that you know that you're, it's not as good of a sensor, it's not as good of a robot, and so therefore the data is weighted less or something like that? Or? Not quite. The we will know like the total station make and model and serial number and stuff like that. And T4D gives you the, the three sigma values and what we call the H-top. And so based on the total station accuracy, you'll get different results for your, your three sigmas and stuff like that. And so you'll have to kind of know where your guns are being used and spec in the right instruments for the right application. So you kind of understand, you know, what accuracies you need. If you only need a five second instrument, you just throw a five second instrument out there and have it run. But T4D is not necessarily going to know like, you know, in my alarms, I want to weight the highest accuracy measurements more than the lowest accuracy measurements. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Well, it used to used to have to have uh, fine, like an S nine with fine. What was it called? Fine, fine lock. Fine lock yeah, to be able to use it for monitoring. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case anymore. It's still kind of the case. So we always recommend that you use uh, fine lock. So fine lock uh, versus auto lock is kind of a, a major topic in in monitoring. So auto lock is really typically seen on like the the 930s and like the construction uh, total stations where you're not necessarily necessarily uh, measuring a bunch of prisms all in the same place. It's really for that machine control application. And really what what that means is any prism in your field of view, the total station is going to lock onto it. Where fine lock gives you much more narrow window of search. And so especially on like a high wall where your prisms are far away and over over a large structure, you need to be able to differentiate between the prism, you know, on the left side versus the right side. And so fine lock lets you, you know, measure a much tighter window where those prisms are. And so depending on the application, you might be able to get away with using um, an instrument without fine lock. But most of the time for monitoring, you're measuring a lot of prisms in a tight location. And because it's automated, you're never going to be able to be able to log in and tell it, like, only measure this and only measure this and only measure this. It's going to turn to and search. 
So if it catches the wrong prism, it'll measure bad data and give you a bad result. Uh, you can get away with it in some applications if you're only measuring a few prisms around a site and you just want to automate it and have it run. But for the most part, when you're using total stations, you always want to have fine lock on there for the you know, automated setups. It's not going to disallow the instrument, though, because it does not have fine lock. Right. So we, we and this is where the product team might be a little bit upset at, at the answer, but we can control it and there's nothing that stops us from using it okay. uh, besides the limiting factor with that auto lock. Well, it just there's a lot of people out there that don't have fine lock robots. Totally, yeah. And so they would want to try to use maybe access monitoring. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't say, sorry, you can't use this gun. You can't do this. Yeah. Then great. Yeah, no reason not to try. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely seen it, like, especially when prisms are kind of in line, it's not able to get the right prism mm -hmm. uh, with auto lock only. But there's probably lots of cases where the prisms are far enough apart that you're not going to have a problem. It's still going to be able to lock on the prism yeah. with you know a regular a regular robot. So for sure. Until the paper drives by or yeah, right. you catch a prism and it's it's gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> if it's really gone, it's gonna struggle. Yeah. <laughs> um I, mean, I was thinking of like the the, the total stations like to grab like car headlights and taillights and stuff. And so even even like at our office where we used to have prisms set up kind of by the road, sometimes they would lock on and get a, a car and freak out and then have to come back later on and, and measure them. So yeah, because all the monitoring prisms are just regular prisms. Exactly. Yeah. So they're all passive. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah. Uh, the way that we kind of automate and control the total stations is with a device that's called the set top M1. Uh, the M1 really acts as an all-in-one uh, kind of automated data collector for the total stations. The whole idea is that it's got the built in uh, 4G modem. So all you do is you put a SIM card in there and then it gets your total station online and, and ready to go. Uh, it manages all that con connectivity for you. So there's a web page for the actual M1 device you can log into, um, control it remotely, use the camera, and stuff like that. Uh, it does all the power and control and round scheduling and stuff for the total station. So it makes it essentially an autonomous setup that sends data over to T4D in real time. Uh, the advantage of having it operate kind of as an independent system is that if there's any ever any data outage, uh, it'll keep running the field and keep recording data. And then as soon as that data connectivity is restored, it will backfill all those missing rounds and backfill all those missing elements. Uh, a lot of times what we see happen is is something like um, like T40 runs on a Windows computer and Windows loves to go through updates kind of on its own whim. Uh, and a lot, a lot of times it'll update, reboot, and then it won't restart properly. And so the system might be down for a couple hours at a time. Uh, and then as soon as that system is rebooted, it, it automatically backfills all the missing measurements, gives you all that, that data kind of um, continuity in there. So it's a really good tool and a really easy way to automate the systems. Um, on the GNSS side, this is also a fairly open protocol uh, for T40, so we can work with almost any GNSS receiver that's out there, uh, even some of the third-party ones like the Leica and the Topcon and stuff like that. And so if you have a site that has a mixed bag of, of whatever has been out there, because over the past 20 years you've bought from every manufacturer, uh, all we need is one Trimble data feed into T40 for the clocks and orbits. Uh, and then we can process essentially any standard format, you know, RTCM feed from any receiver. So is RTCM would be the feed that you'd be looking for? It's a standard feed, third. yeah. Okay. Exactly. We have a dedicated monitoring receiver in the Trimble portfolio called the R750. Uh, there's an R750 monitoring variant uh, that's a fully spec receiver. So it's got all the constellations, it's got a bunch of onboard storage, uh, 50 hertz processing, or 50 hertz tracking and 20 hertz processing and, and really high data rate and output. So it's a fully configured receiver, but because it's a monitor receiver, it's it's kind of single purpose. And so you can't use it for things like a uh, base station or TK corrections. You can't log into it for like an entry caster and stuff like that. It can only send data to T40. So it's at a much lower price point. So you can bundle the antenna with the receiver in this config and then be out there and monitoring for, for less than you would with a fully configured base station. Uh, what we typically recommend is that people use the R750 kind of full config with, with everything on there and with the base station and, and base rover setup as you're kind of monitoring base stations around the site. So you can use those for, for RGK and kind of anything you want. And then for your monitoring stations, you can add in, you know, the, the five or 10 GNSS uh, R750 monitoring stations. And those, you don't really need 15 base stations on your site. So cutting back that price and, and having all that data in there can be really nice. If you want 15 base stations, we'll do it, but you know, might not need it. Um, one of the really nice things about T40 is that it's built on this really powerful um, kind of network adjustment engine. And so with that GNSS data, um, the real time and the post-process data have very different kind of uh, accuracies and results. 
Uh, real time data is great because you can get data, you know, at 20 hertz or, or one second data intervals. So especially on high walls and tailings dams that are maybe about to fail, you can get that really up to date uh, second by second position information. But maybe you're only able to get one or two centimeter accuracy out of the system. And with local base stations, you can get really high precision real time data out of it, but you would never use it for maybe your long term monitoring data. So having that post processing engine that goes along with that, where you get your data out every four hours, every 12 hours, every 24 hours, can take that data and make that trend really, really tight and really precise. Where you can use it as like an optical optical backset for your resection, not really degrade your total station data, uh, and have that really precise settlement data. There is going to be a little bit more noise in those measurements, but having those longer um, data processing intervals is a really good way to, to increase that precision and get really good trends out of the system. So having both those engines can can be really really helpful. Um, in terms of what those setups actually look like, so total station, I'm sure that's fairly intuitive for everybody. You have your back sites, you have your four sites. You set it up, it runs automatically, it sends that data to T4 and you get your, your trends on there. Uh, for GNSS, it's kind of a similar idea uh, where you have your, your monitoring antennas kind of recording those positions and sending that data and getting those displacements. Um, we always want to have good uh, GNSS um, base stations. Uh, that way we have something to reference off of, really similar to that optical backside, optical setup where you have your resection geometry, all the displacements are, are from your actual um, fixed points. Same idea with GNSS. Different kind of um, maybe application to it, though, because you can get much faster data out of GNSS. Uh, and because it's not line of sight, you can cover a much larger area. And so especially if your tailings dam is going to be, you know, a couple of miles long, it could be gigantic. Uh, or if you're measuring for, for wider area settlement across the mine, you don't need a line of sight. The baseline is going to be 35 kilometers. Your base station can be super far away and in a much more stable area. And you can still get really good data out of that system. Uh, in T40, you can also combine the system. So that way you have your GNSS measurements with your total station measurements, and all that data is kind of being used uh, and, and intermingled. The, the cool thing to do is to integrate all your GNSS data with your total station data. So instead of having them as separate data sets, you have that integrated system. Uh, the idea with the integrated system is that when your backsites are shifting and they're in your zone of influence, you put that GNSS antenna on there, and you can get updated coordinates on your backsites. So you can use your GNSS antennas as monitoring points and as your optical resection point. Uh, and so you can turn your total station to it, get an updated coordinate and, and measure uh, all your monitoring data, even if that entire area is, is shifting. Uh, any questions on kind of those optical setups? Um, who here has worked with the, with the geotechnical sensors? Uh, <laughs> That was all the geotechs. Uh, us surveyors didn't do that. So we have five surveyors at the mine and then five geotechs. Do the same thing, same equipment, but just different focuses. That yeah, makes sense. Uh, anybody online, do you have experience with um, with using geotechnical sensors? He's gone to get a cup of coffee. Is that so? No. <laughs> uh, so for those that are new to the geotechnical world, um, geotechnical sensors are are the world. I guess the world of geotechnical engineering is is vast. There's um, a sensor essentially to measure every different parameter. The way I kind of think about it is that the geodetic side is really good for measuring those surface conditions, so surface movements and and surface trends and how things kind of settle over time. And geotechnical sensors give you that subsurface data set. So measuring things like the, the pore pressure and the water levels and like with an IPI kind of measuring that subsurface uh, displacement. So they almost always go hand in hand on these big structures like dams and mines. Um, but they typically be, or they tend to be in a different world than the, the surveying world. So if you haven't seen it before, it can feel a little bit daunting. The, the way I think about it is that if there's a parameter to measure, there's a sensor for it. And if there's a sensor for it, we can automate that and bring it into T40. So it's, it's simple in theory to kind of get data into T40. But maybe a little bit more complicated when you ask somebody what sensor they're using and then what they're using it for. Uh, the way that it works for us is we try to keep it kind of as, as simple as possible. So we have our sensor that connects to the data logger, and the data logger is what's actually recording that data and transmitting it in, in essentially near real time over to T40. We have a data logger system that plugs into all the different geotechnical sensors that are out, that are out there. They are battery powered and use a long range radio to send data back to a single gateway location. And then the gateway is what collects data from all the different data loggers on site. 
gets it online and transmits that data over to uh, T4D for analysis and display and reporting along and stuff like that. So it's essentially the, the data logging and telemetry system that sits on top of all those geotechnical sensors. Um, the data loggers being uh, battery powered and, and radio communication is, is, I think, a huge advantage when it comes to just uh, ease of use and kind of long term maintenance. So the batteries in these things last anywhere from five to 10 years out of the site, depending on your sampling rates. And they only take a couple of minutes to configure with your sensors. So essentially, you splice your sensor into the into the data logger. You plug your phone in the data, log, data logger and tell it what sensor it is and kind of what parameters you expect to measure. And then you just tell it the sampling rate and what frequency you want, and then it sends that data back to the gateway. The radio itself is is super long range. Uh, they can go anywhere from from nine to to fifteen kilometers, like a ten mile range. It's really with line of sight, it just goes to the horizon. And so it's really nice for setting up a large area, but also in terms of where you install that gateway. So the geotechnical data loggers themselves are robust and battery powered and, and radio configurable. So you just you know bolt them to a wall or put them on a pole and send them out there and forget them and they run. The gateway is a little bit more complicated because it has you know a 4G modem in there. It collects all the data from the data loggers. It's got a little computer in there to convert all the units. So it's a, a kind of a more complicated piece. So it needs a little bit more power. It needs more stable communication. And so finding a location to install it can be a little bit trickier. And so just having the flexibility of knowing that you have the range and the capacity to put it essentially anywhere you need. You can put it like inside your field office and then throw the antenna outside with a big booster antenna and then really easily measure kind of everything on your site. So super flexible installation. The way that it kind of looks on, on something like a tailings dam is you're going to have all your data loggers essentially installed over your boreholes. So your boreholes might have an IPI or a piezo or some sort of other geotechnical sensor in there. You plug your data logger into the sensor. And then it transmits all your data back to the uh, gateway location. Um, the gateway collects data from all your all your data loggers on site. So essentially, no matter what sensor you have, plug it in the data logger, plug your gateway in, and then your gateway is what sends data over to T4D for your final kind of delivery and analysis. Uh, in terms of compatibility, there are essentially three main flavors of geotechnical sensor out there, and they really differ both in terms of what they're measuring and how they measure it. And how they measure is, is more kind of what we think about on that communication protocol or that measurement protocol. Uh, the three most common ones, and really all of them fall into one of these categories, is, is vibrating wire, which actually sends a pulse down a wire and it vibrates and it measures some sort of frequency and then returns and converts from frequency to pore pressure or length or distance or whatever it is you're measuring. Uh, analog sensor is going to measure something like, like the resistance across some sort of, of sensor in the ground. Uh, and then your digital data loggers are more of your specialty side, so things like your um, IPIs and your weather stations that use like a mode bus protocol or some sort of digital protocol. And so you plug those in, uh, configured for the, the right communication, and then it logs that data and pulls it in and, and sends it over. Uh, as I kind of said, there, there's a million different types of geotechnical sensors. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in, in the vibrating wire and analog and digital space. Sometimes it's better to use a digital sensor versus a vibrating wire sensor and vice versa. But the general rule of thumb is that there's you know, a sensor for everything. We have a data logger for it, and they're always compatible. Um, the data loggers that we have, because they only use the communication protocol, are essentially sensor and, and uh, manufacturer agnostic. So as long as your sensor is measuring a scientific unit or something that's fairly standardized, we can plug it in and work with it. So it doesn't matter if you have your piezos from RST and your, your shape arrays for measure and and your, your um, you know, inclinometers from from Geocon, all the different manufacturers out there, they just plug into the data logger, and then we configure it and, and pull that data in. So it's a really easy config. You don't have to be an expert in the geotechnical world to plug things into a data logger and get that data flowing. You just have to understand a few of the basic parameters and, and plug in the right data logger. There are also uh, tilt meters in the geotechnical portfolio, and we think about these as really an embedded sensor inside of a data logger. And so it's it's one unit where you don't have to plug it into an external sensor. You can just deploy it, configure it, and then and then you're done. The tilt meters are really, really complementary to total stations and, and GNSS and radar. The the advantage to a tilt meter, it's a lot cheaper than a total station. It's more expensive than a single prism point, but it's not going to cost you the same as like an S9 long range. They're fairly inexpensive and easy to deploy. Uh, and they're non line of sight. So especially when the range is going to be too far. Uh, or if you can't see around a corner, or if you just want to supplement your total station data, it's really easy to deploy that tilt meter. And you're not going to get that same 3D settlement and 3D movement on a prism, or that you would as on a prism, but you're going to get really good differential settlement data. The one thing that a tilt meter won't do is perfect vertical settlement. Uh, and so if your entire structure just drops, you're not necessarily going to get good tilt data out of it. 
you can make arguments that that a structure never really truly just drops vertically in space. Maybe sections of it will. So a few tilt meters might miss the data, but you can supplement that with the other tilt meters in that area and understand how that whole structure is behaving and kind of explain what's happening and understand it. So not quite the same data quality as something like a, a toll station, but it can be really, really useful for supplementing that data. Uh, or if the budget doesn't call for a full automated setup, you can throw some tilt meters out there for a fraction of the cost and, and have an automated system. Um, any questions? Sweet. Um, I think now we've been at it for about an hour. Maybe we'll take a, a quick uh, 10 minute break, <laughs> get a coffee, use the restroom, whatever you need. We'll be back here at um, 1025. Yeah. So the bathrooms, or if you go out the door just on the far, you'll see the hallway down on the far side, the, just right there to your left. And there's also bathrooms downstairs too. And there's always outside. There's a break room down there too. If, uh... There's a kitchen down there. So a picture can get her tea refill. <laughs> Did you find some, by the way? Oh. Uh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Not coffee though. It's a non-coffee no, option. Is that what you do? Yeah. <laughs> but you said there were. Other teas? Right? Oh, no. oh. <laughs> I'm a, a non-tea drinker, so oh, you don't come I'm to clueless. Office. What's that? Do you come to the office very often? Oh, almost every day. Every day yeah. Okay. yeah, so this is, I mostly work out of here. Ryan is more outside, but we, mm -hmm. we cross paths a lot, though. We're partners in this. Partners for life. <laughs> <laughs> partners for life, but not We're life partners. partners. Did you not think? <laughs> oh. <laughs> So Roland told me that you got here a day early or something like that, so you could yeah, I test the slopes out a little bit. Uh, is that inaccurate? Uh, it, it it was it's accurate, but that's what I told him. Um, but then <laughs> I got sick over the weekend. <laughs> oh, while I was so I I rented an RV and uh, uh wanted to spend some time you know on the mountains and then go to Zion. Uh, ended up getting a fever while I was here uh, over the weekend. Uh, so yeah, I didn't end up going uh, on the slopes or anything, but just over it seemed like biking, got sent an electric bike. Yeah. You were at Zion just this past weekend? Yeah. So was I. Yeah. I was there. We were in the park. Um, we got there Friday night, and we were in the park all day Saturday and Sunday. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was there Saturday, Sunday, Monday. OK, yeah, we came back on Monday. Um, so what what did you end up doing in, in the park? Road kind of like the Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just bike the entire path. So you got like a regular bike or an e-bike or? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah you can. You biked all the way to the end, yeah, to the yeah. Narrows trailhead. Yeah, uh, and then I started to do the Narrows uh, trailhead or trail, but then I realized, you know what, I'm still a little bit feverish. <laughs> Maybe I should, you know, go all the way. You were going to get in the water? No, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was not prepared for that. I saw people with like their, you know, like gator, their big, you know, oh, yeah. overalls and everything, like their six pounds. Like, I'm not prepared. Yeah, the water was high. So, yeah, you yeah. and cold. Yeah, I'm sure. I'd, I'd love to do it again, though. It looks really fun. All the pictures I saw were absolutely amazing. Uh, but so you were staying in the, um, like, a RV park. Uh, in Springdale or? Yeah, uh, so uh, sorry, no, not in Springdale. So there's this, if you wanted to go to an RV we, we park in Zion, you should have uh, booked it like months in advance. I decided to come like maybe two weeks ago, uh, but I actually found this family ranch who uh, uh, rents out kind of like this space for primitive camping. So, you know, I didn't have any plugins or anything for the RV, but I was just able to stay still in Zion, but on a family ranch. So in the park? Yeah. Well, you, so it was actually, uh, so you had to go through the park and there's like this area I know the that way technically was not in Zion and it's owned by like, this, the Wright family. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that they just have this like, and this won't be the last time. Yeah, exactly. to come in and 
You still have that? Is that where the horses are? Is that where the horses are? I took the entire system, including the laptop. Of oh, the yeah. I didn't yeah. know this is a cabinet. So you went through the gate. Yeah. Just wait. And yeah. you went to the gate where the bus would go. Yeah, and you the, the, the gate lifted up for you, and you drove up there, and that's where you ended up. I was just talking to you over the phone quite a few times, trying to get it figured out. I think I must have been there. It just took like, so much effort, but my IT guy was like, look, I don't need this computer back. Why don't you just keep this so you don't have to do all this again? Yeah. So I was in Zion, not So now I think our big really? is... Yeah. So, I wonder yeah, where you were. Data card. We had to use you didn't have to drive yeah. through Springdale to get and there? No. That was such a shit go. I ended up getting so turned into collections for that. Because Holy we no We needed it so quickly to go through the corporate. So you went to the virgin and you took a left virgin into the coal lab area. Yeah. That's where you stayed. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to get the card in my name. That makes sense. Pay for it. Okay. And then when the project was over, I canceled it. Yeah. What's that? Well, whoever I talked to didn't get it right most of them, so they were continuing to bill us. Oh, God. And I didn't know it until I got a collection notice that I was a year behind on the T Mobile payments. <laughs> I, I can't believe it took that long. Yeah. So the company paid it, but it was still in my name and collection. So I was like, no, 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 we're going to say that's right. Yeah. That's, that's wild. Those early days of uh, getting the M ones out there, it was like, because they're they're built in Spain, and so the yes. people in Spain were like, "You just use a Spanish SIM card." Yeah. And they were like, "Right." So it's kind of yeah. yeah. How's that work in Australia? So you have to spend some time, <laughs> and then you we've got to figure it out. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So they can um, use yeah. the NFRD, like yeah. Yeah. So so it's, it's, it's uh, AT and T to actually get or GSM so SIM cards. So I've, I've heard yeah. people yeah. getting away with like a roaming SIM, Netflix networks one, but no direct Verizon expense. Saturday. And that's more to do with Verizon. Did you wait a while? Oh, no, you so had an email. Right. So yeah, what if no, we were so, to set it yeah, up? I, I see the, the uh, connection Wi-Fi for the shuttle. I was like, I don't want to. Wi-Fi is really long enough. E-bikes is the way to go. It was purpose for the weak signal for security. You can just which so could argue is a good or a bad idea. Stuff, you know, so it's, it can be a little bit unstable on a Wi-Fi only connection. I've seen people use Wi-Fi for years and not have the problem. And I've also seen people never be able to get on it. So it's it's one of those try it if it works. It's great if it doesn't then. So did you just try it? You rode your bike up there just yeah, now. I think I'll try that. You go back a second. See if I can. Yeah, I was just on one day, and then yeah. one day. Where these bridges are, like five minutes. So I was in the parking lot. Yeah, so if there's a problem, so you can go there's probably there. over. Yeah. But what I want to do is. Oh, that's so funny that you were down there at the same time. So yeah. I can keep the Wi-Fi unit plugged in yeah. and close. Yeah. And I know it'll have phone reception or right. you know data reception. So you use a solar setup with an inverter for the modem and stuff. Yeah. Okay. And that was a, another problem we had out there because we were so remote on that first project. Yeah. We tried to use solar, but it kept frying the the fuse in between the uh -oh. battery connection and the set top. Yeah. And so we ended up plugging in a extension cord to a generator oh, to charge okay. a battery like once a day. Yeah. And then we ran from the battery to the set top. Interesting. So it was continuously powered, and we just made sure to keep charging the battery so it would never die. So we, there were a lot of hurdles, but we figured them out. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> funny. We we try to solve, try to solve everything that we see eventually. So now we we work with somebody based out of New Jersey that builds a solar kit for us yeah. to get it to spec. Nice. It's all it's all off the shelf stuff, but they test it for us, which is really nice. Right. So it's 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 pricey because you get really good components, but it's like tested, there's breakers built in, there's a solar controller, there's like all these settings pre-configured for you. Right. So it's like a nice plug and play kind of solar solution. Nice. So if you need something, you can you can talk to Monson, they can order it for you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think I think that's gonna be the way to go because I already have the permanent setup that we custom built a steel frame for it. Yeah. So if I could mount that under the bridge to yeah. just have the total station permanently there where nobody could get to it, yeah, that would be perfect. Yeah, that's what we do. And then I could run the solar panel yeah. up on the bridge right mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, exactly. As long as it doesn't snow and get wiped out by a snow to fall. That does happen sometimes. You can fix everything but weather. What's that? You can fix everything but weather. Right. Yeah. So can you guys use the SPS total stations now instead of like the S7 or S9? 
there's that's kind of what we're talking about. So they're not really like officially supported, um, but because they use the same basically everything as the S series, you can plug them in and use them. Okay. So it's it's another one of those situations where you might be able to get away with it. Um, so you can plug them in and see if it messes up with that auto lock at all. And we don't really test the SPS like to run 24 seven. So even though they have the same motors and the same internals and, and really a lot of the same stuff as the S series, we haven't deployed enough of them to really have a good idea of how they behave over like a year. Okay. Uh, so we, we do recommend the S series, uh, but if you have an old one sitting around and you just kind of don't care what happens to it, it's no reason not to test it. And see what happens. Okay. Space for Yeah, because I have eight SPS guns because we use them to run the machines and now we have a white paper for that same job. Mm -hmm. So we have guns that are used all the time, but if I could take one and use it for the system, it would be easier than renting one for two years right it would on a rail project it'd be a little tricky because the prisms are so close together mm -hmm. and even the s series with the fine lock sometimes messes up and, and gets confused between the prisms especially at the farther ends so it's you might not have very good luck with it but it can't hurt to try okay. mm -hmm. So I thought more of the geotechs would have been shown up. Oh, it's it's totally fine. <laughs> you can teach them all about it now. Yeah, yeah. Off of mine that had that massive slow flow. Yeah. Okay. They always show that and do the damage got like pressure. And they yeah, there it is. <laughs> that, was, that was a big one. Okay, so you guys have massive sight. Yeah, it's like three and a half miles by two and a half. But uh, over here is our tailings pound. Uh, when my dad was a kid, you could see 21st South here, 201 all the way to 80, it was flat. It raises five to eight feet every year. Wow. When I go to see a pound of dirt, <laughs> <laughs> that big hole has to put the dirt somewhere. So. What is reclamation that? That's mm -hmm. Uh, big. So we're seeding the uh, one sides of it and all that stuff. So it's just a big pile. Of so they're not going to make you like bring all the tailings back in at some point and make it look more natural. Far as I know, we're capping it as we go. We have the slope and stuff like that. So the bottom half of the impoundment is already topsoiled and seeded and all that stuff. So we kind of go along. It's a lot easier to bring to the end. That yes, massive in the project. <laughs> yeah, but they're still debating on how to close the. Uh, so you can't fly. Huge hole was to do with it, you know. That's right. Since there's all the spring water, we either keep pumping the water out or trying to fill up, but with all the arsenic and all the other good stuff in there, you have to keep treating it. So, yes. Nice. Like, hey, just turn it into the biggest landfill ever. Nice. Yeah, just fill back up. Makes sense. <laughs> Talk about the tailings. Oh, it's the, the pit, the reclamation. What do we do? Because it's still in debate, you know, what do we do? Just keep pumping water out or let it fill back up with water? Or either way, they got to 
treated. Whenever that time comes that we yeah. would just let it fill up with water. Or keep someone on staff, keep pumping water out. And, but yeah, I don't, still debating and what to do, but then we keep pushing back next, push back next, push back. I think we're projected to go to 2040 now. So life of mine. <clears throat> and that just got pushed back again, right? Yes. And now we're doing underground and surface mining. We'll talk about underground the, next. Yeah. yeah. I just feel like that mine's never going to end, right? I mean, when did it? When did it start? It's over 120 years ago. Dang, yeah. yeah. So if you look at like a molar, uh, all the easy stuff's gone. Now it's the the roots of the the tooth kind oh, of makes sense. Yeah, but that yeah. and so, but yeah, but. About a half mile down has a big deposit of, of molybdenum, molly. Yeah, it's a steel hardener, and we're using it in oil refineries and stuff like that. But has a big stockpile of that, but it's half mile down. Probably. So there's some good stuff down there, but it's not quite expensive enough yet to to get down there. Yeah. yeah. So they're trying to do tandem unearth and keep doing the surface. As well, we're mining under the down too. Yeah, I feel I've always felt like in my lifetime they'll be mining out there. You know, it did shut down for a while. Seven. When was that? Um, like seven. in the eighties, late eighties. I think they did something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, I think it was just on hiatus during those because of the price of copper or whatever. But yeah, um, but yeah, then. It, and during that time, it was like, oh, it'll never restart. You know, it's kind of yeah. just what people were saying around, but people that didn't know. But I mean, I just feel like it's just going to go on forever. Yeah. It's just there's so much going on out there that, yeah. you know, you guys know what you're doing. So, <laughs> so just the bigger it gets, Mother Nature keeps trying to fill that hole back up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, just find it. Gravity, you know, water. So. It always wins eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, like, how many, is it 10,000 people employed by Rio Tinto here locally? I think it's only like 2,000. Oh, only 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> There's not that big, but all the other industries and then we, contractors and stuff like that. But I don't, yeah. I don't think it's, yeah. Huge actual Rio Tinto employees, yeah, yeah, and contractors, subcontractors, and all of the mm -hmm. services we provide here. I'd be curious to see what the reclamation plan is for that, like theoretically, what it would be, you know, well, like what the what the heck? I mean, <laughs> is it been, just to let it fill with water? I mean, well, we've been working on the Salt Lakes Valley side too, the East Waste Rock reclamation so we're topsoiling it and so the bottom half is going to start looking nice and so we're kind of making it look nice after we're done with it but <laughs> nobody will have any idea yeah that's <laughs> grass and stuff big hole so it's it better mountain yeah <laughs> a little couple benches you know little plateaus but, uh. at least that haul trucks off the side of the mountain so. yeah <laughs> oh i remember that that was the one that yeah, yeah, it was there for quite a while. Yeah, but it fell off the down the. So they were doing finger dumps and they didn't do a very good job stripping in. But yeah, bad design. Yeah. Well, so it happened it back in the seventies and eighties too, because mm -hmm. they tried that on the Bingham Canyon, trying to do the same thing, and all truck went over too. And, well, we don't have a very good memory. We keep rotating all this stuff. Bad ideas. <laughs> we, plus they're sold. We like to hire straight out of college and put them in the short term engineering from all these colleges, and it's it's tough. It's, they make a lot of. They learn the theory, so they just want to try it. Oh, I learned this in school. Let's try this. Let's try this. We're like, tried that back in the day. Let's uh, keep going with works. So try not to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, well, it, then, it's a very fascinating history, truly. And then our management stuff moves all over the time. So there was a stockpile of gold because they couldn't get it down to the crusher. So they just started stockpiling it. And then they switched management and all that stuff. And they put a haul road right through it and never went back to it. <laughs> and that was that, I guess. 
<laughs> and that was that. Just so here at the camp town. Yeah. Well, it's still there. It, it's still there. Just a hall road. <laughs> <laughs> Through the gold. Yeah. What the heck? Next, next pushback, but yeah. When the decision, you're just like, what? Yeah. But when copper prices, right before 2008, when copper was pretty good, and then right before that thing down there, copper was so good, we were sending pretty good high-grade copper to the dump because we were having 1% copper. You know, we had some great stuff. So what we're sending to the crusher now is what we sent to the dump earlier. <laughs> Well, yeah, a lot of talk about reclaiming the dump. Yeah, you could reclaim. Yeah, there's good ore that maybe got dumped. Yeah, just how hard would it be to get to it? You know. And yeah. No, I've heard rumors people trying like, hey, we want to buy your tailings, go through it. You know, well, better passing, better technology can try to extract some more good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Small companies in Nevada that do that to go down with all the old shutdown mines and. We process the tailings with better technology and get more gold out for a cheaper price. Yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's 120 years of stockpiling it. Oh, it's all right there, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, should we push on a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. Sweet. So now I'll kind of take us through the the underground uh, workflows. And really what that, that is, is is some guided workflows in like Trimble Access and TBC, which is the SX12 around a lot of really specific things that are done in the underground space. And you, I know you mentioned you guys go underground, but as um, if anybody online has, has kind of rejoined, does anybody work um, underground or have underground pieces of, of your mind? Hmm. We had some of the Nevada guys on this, the Northern Nevada guys. It's a shame that some of them are on here because there's a bunch of that in Northern Nevada for sure. I imagine, yeah. So we can tell them all about it later. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So the the whole idea is that the underground mining is really focused on the three pieces of of underground extraction, essentially. So you have your once you have your design uh, for the underground, underground mine, kind of know where you're going to go. You take that design, put it in TBC, put it in terminal access, and then take it out in the field and help kind of guide what's happening out there. So we have a bunch of tools focused on those set out workflows. So guiding the drill holes and the blast patterns and stuff like that, and really helping the surveyors stake out specific locations for whatever needs to happen. There's a lot of tools we have in terms of collection. So collecting data and collecting material from, from the field. So taking as builds, doing a lot of, of volume extractions and geologic inspections. In some cases, a lot of that monitoring data too. So actually working um, kind of in that underground space. And then once you get back above ground too, there's a lot of tools with scanning stockpiles and volume reporting. To help understand how much is being taken out of the earth, how much from that stockpile has been extracted, and how much is, is left over to kind of get your yields and, and your returns on, on what's being, being done. So there's a lot of really guided tools out there. The portfolio is a lot simpler than in the monitoring space. Uh, we essentially have terminal access, DSX12, and TBC. And then there's modules that go along with that. So mining and tunneling have, have tools in there that really guide that set out the collection and all that volume reporting. So it's a much simpler kit to kind of deploy. You can give this to a surveyor and then go out and, and do all these really specific things. Um, terminal access is maybe the key piece that lets you take that data from the design the engineers and then put it out in the field. Uh, the terminal access mining and, and really tunneling, tunneling modules, all the other same workflows, have the ability to take that design from TBC, import it into terminal access, and then has all those key features and assets and stuff in there. So when you do your scanning and when you, when you do your reporting and you're staking, staking out and setting out, Everything from that design is in your data collector, and you can point to very specific locations. Um, terminal access also has a lot of in-field scan inspection tools. And so when you take those point clouds out there, there's a lot of verification that you can do. There's a lot of point-to-point -point comparison, point cloud-to-point -point cloud comparisons. Um, taking the, the as built with your point cloud and comparing it to your design models, doing the overbreak and underbreak, a lot of really specific stuff you can do right there in the field without, without having to go back to the office and like reprocess that data and do kind of a back and forth workflow. Uh, the SX12, I think, is is like the greatest underground tool that's ever been made. Uh, the SX12 is an integrated uh, scanner and total station in there, so it's a one-second instrument. Uh, it's got an 800-meter range. Um, I think it's a one-mil EDM, so it's a really good total station. And it's got a really solid scanner in there. <clears throat> Granted, it's not going to necessarily beat something like an X7 or X9 when it comes to true dedicated scanning, 
Uh, but the advantage with the SX12 is that it's an integrated workflow. And so you can run your resection and know your, your SX12 position. And then your point cloud is automatically geo-referenced in triple access. So you don't have to set up two instruments. So from the same setup, you can reset and then scan. And then because you have that location, you can update your design files and do a lot of back and forth with TDC. And there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with that scan process in the field. So having an integrated scanner is really, really cool. Uh, it's also got a really bright green laser, which when I first heard about it, I thought it was a little bit, bit gimmicky because I was like, how important can a laser be? But when you're underground, you're doing these stakeouts and these setouts, it's, it's actually super important. So you can turn that laser on and use it to guide where your surveyor is marking and, and painting. And you can use that for a lot of machine guidance and staking out and setting out. Uh, and because it, it has that laser, it can really just be that one man clean. So it's a huge time saver and a, and a big kind of labor multiplier. Uh, TBC and especially the, the mining and the underground modules like uh, tunneling really help go from the, the kind of doing that field finish workflow. So TBC is not going to be your design software. Your mining engineers are going to use their, their CAD program and their, their specific design software to actually make those tunnel designs, those underground mine designs. Mm -hmm. but you can then load that data into Trimble uh, Business Center, into TBC, and then prep that data so that there's actual assets and things to go to um, kind of in the field. So you can take that design, turn it into something to put out in the field, and then vice versa, right? So when your server is out there, they collect those point clouds, they collect all that data. You put it back into TBC, update those designs, and then send that back to the mining engineer. And the mining engineer has a true recorded as built uh, based on their design with updates from the field, uh, all through kind of that, that TBC and Trimble Connect workflow. Uh, we kind of think about TBC as that, that single source of truth for all your geodetic data. So it's integrating both sides, right? The office data from the designer and the field data from the surveyor, kind of bridging those together and making it as like a true geospatial data set. Uh, in terms of setting out, um, this is maybe one of the most uh, or, or biggest features, biggest time saving features in like the Trimble Access tunneling and mining modules, where you can use, uh, and this is maybe a better image for it. So if you think about just setting out something as simple as your drill holes and your blast patterns, these are all based on those design parameters. And as much as we'd like to think, the, the design never really matches what's happening out in the field. And so these actual locations of where these drill holes need to start is going to change a lot depending on how that drilling and blasting actually happens. And so what you can do is, Drilling and blasting happens, site gets stabilized, the survey goes in and then they scan that area. And they can compare that scan in the field to that, that design and that, that kind of intended location. Um, terminal access knows the starting and ending position of those drill holes and those blast patterns. And based on that design, it'll update that, that pass belt and give you a new intersection point. And then it'll automatically point to the actual location where that drill hole is supposed to go. And so instead of having to, to kind of guess what's going to happen because the design varies a little bit from the actual <clears throat> field kind of as built in, you can automatically update. Uh, the SX12 knows where to point, it just points to it. Uh, and then from there, you can, you can stake it out and set it out without having to worry about the design changes and updates. And that all happens in the field without having to do that, that you know, take it from triple access to TBC and you process it, re-update your design and go back in the field. It does that automatically. Uh, so that set out is really one of the, the biggest features of that underground, underground set. Uh, in terms of collection too, so there's a lot you can do on the data collection side, especially because the SX12 is that, that integrated scanner. Point clouds seem to dominate that underground workflow uh, because a lot of times you're not able to, to do, you know, drone scanning and stuff like that. So your survey going in and actually getting high precision, high density point cloud is super important. Um, and having it just auto geo or automatically geo references is, is a huge, huge time saver. Um, Monitoring can be done in these like tunneling and, and mining underground modules by doing like convergence calculations. But the monitoring is a little bit different than what you would think about in, in like a high wall and a tailings dam where you're measuring kind of discrete uh, movements and discrete measurements. Um, monitoring maybe is even, even done in a different way where you're not monitoring the actual structure of the tunnel, but you're monitoring what's being removed and extracted and, and, um, and kind of the volumes and, and, um, and, and different, uh, I guess, like mineral recovery there. So you're doing like the volume reports and you're doing the as built and you're kind of updating that way. And all that's being used to monitor really the operation of the mine uh, and not necessarily monitoring the actual movement of that structure. Um, monitoring underground in terms of movement monitoring can be a much more complicated question because it's such a confined space. So doing things like an automated total station can be just much more complicated because there's not really good comms. Power down, there's a challenge of just having good, good backside geometry. You can't use GNSS. can be really, really challenging. Um, so going in and scanning and having the, the ability to like run a ring and do a convergence on it and run that every you know day or week when you're just out there doing your normal workflows can be a huge value add. Just 
easy calculation done right there in, in triple access. Uh, and then you can add another sensor to like tilt meters and laser distance meters to kind of auto automatically measure these high risk areas. We typically don't see a whole lot of automated monitoring on the ground, but but it can be done. Those integrated workflows kind of can help uh, in these different key areas. Um, again, having the SX12 with that integrated scanner um, and total station is a huge asset uh, when it comes to that that setup and that um, that data collection. Um, the scanner is really good, really high precision and quick. Again, your X7 is going to do a better job if all you need to do is scan stockpiles over and over and over and over again and do that all day long. The SX12 is going to be great for anything um, where you need that georeference one cloud. The volume reporting side of things is also um, maybe just as important as everything that happens on the ground, uh, especially when it comes to kind of figuring out those rates of recovery to help the engineers guide, you know, where that, that mine is going, how it's being extracted, and, and what's being done. Um, there's a lot you can do in terms of, of you know, collecting data with an SX12 or an X7 and, and scanning piles uh, and doing volume calculations that way. There's really no need for georeferencing when it comes to, to volume reports and stockpiles and things like that. And so there's no real need for post-processing. And so when you go out and you scan, you set up and you, you link all your scans together, you get a volume report essentially instantaneously out of the data collector and deliver that with Trimble Connect to, to TPC or straight to the office to the mine engineers. Um, the team's also been doing a lot in terms of, of what we call it like feature extraction on the, the mining side. And so if you think about, you know, when you fly your drone data, you might have your stockpiles be captured in there just as a part of the workflow. There's there's modules in, I think it's the TPC photogrammetry um, set where it's automatically going to recognize those stockpiles based on like machine learning algorithms and a little bit of AI development. So instead of having to go through and define your stockpiles, you just say, give me my stockpiles and it pulls out all of them for you. You can do a little bit of refining. I think it's like 99% accurate. Uh, and then it gives you your volume reports. It classifies your stockpiles, and it makes it just a whole lot of We actually saw this work at the Trimble Power Week. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <clears throat> the automatic creation of piles. You just picking the piles and it like the AI that's part of it. Plus, there's AI that you can actually learn. You can teach it to have its own models yeah. as well. But just the the ones that come automatically are pretty unbelievable how you can it's super. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, if you guys are interested, there's a, a whole team dedicated to that AI and like auto feature extraction stuff, not just in mining, but just generally. Um, and there's it's like your own trainable model, essentially. So you can get the data sets and you can say like, even if you're not working on mine side, you can be working like with mobile mapping data or whatever reality capture you have. You can say like, you know, I know that mine is good. My mind is going to have these very particular features. You can say train the model and give it all those features give it a few examples and tell it what it is. And then it goes through and it's like, okay, I need to recognize this in every single data set. And then it's going to start pulling it out for you. So it's a really, really unique kind of thing that Trimble's working on. If you guys have questions, we can set you up with uh, the product manager for that team and do like a bigger demo and over and stuff. So cool. um, think about it. We're more than happy to share whatever you whatever need. Um, any questions on the underground workflows? Uh, it's an area where I'm always learning more about it, so I would not classify myself as an expert. Uh, but we have a lot of, of really, really good tools uh, around it. So if you want to learn more, uh, feel free to reach out uh, or give me questions I can try to answer. Would you say that the Mines uh, Access module has, it's a little bit more, it sounded like it was more automated for volume calculations than just what, you, what we have in Access? Yeah, that's right. Okay sense. Um, now I'll get into kind of the other other solutions that we see might be helpful on a mine. Um, for, for full clarity, I guess, Trimble's never really been as strong as we'd like in the mining space. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with historic kind of, of maybe focus from Trimble's side more on the construction workflows and the server workflows. So we are trying to, to play a little bit of catch up. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot that we have that could be used in the mining space, and I'll just kind of uh, cover a few quick topics. Um, but the, the biggest thing that we're looking for is always your feedback in, in the world of, of mining. Uh, so if you're if you're always working the same tools and kind of see different applications and different needs, just let us know and we'll work on, on developing them. One of the things that we've we've seen is that perfect dig is used like everywhere. Um, and that's not really like a, a particularly difficult um, solution to replicate, and we could build our own uh, thermal fairly easily. But the the trick is just getting enough feedback so that we build those right tools and have a good 
um, kind of good foundation to start on. And so we are always looking for people to do pilot projects with, to use new technology to kind of guide what we're doing in the, the kind of development space. And so it's, we're looking for anybody and anybody. <laughs> Uh, so we can get you like on an MDA and start doing this beta testing and work with partners and do these big kind of system rollouts. And then the feedback that you give us is going to guide exactly how to develop it to make sure that the tools we make are actually usable and not just something that you know, somebody at Triple had the bright idea of doing something and we rolled it out and it doesn't work the way we expect. So we always want to develop our tools with you guys in mind and with, with people that actually use them. So any feedback you have, always feel free to, to send it or, or, or send it. Um, but in terms of kind of other system solutions that we have on board that could very easily be adopted in the mining space and add a lot of value, we have things like mobile mapping, uh, where the condition of the haul roads is maybe constantly changing. And even if you just look at, at it from a, a maintenance side on the trucks, having one or two trucks equipped with something simple like a mobile map or an, and an imager that's going by in every few hours and it's getting a new scan of that road and updating it can really quickly decide where that maintenance needs to go. And can instead of having to just guess on things and kind of do maintenance on a schedule, you do it just as needed. You can save a whole bunch of time, a whole bunch of money and, and minimize that, that downtime. Uh, reality capture, like I was saying, a lot of the feature extraction, especially when it comes to things like photogrammetry and LIDAR and different scanning sets, even doing like the, that perfect dig replication, like we can do essentially anything that we need to do with the reality capture data. We have all the tools almost off the shelf, but it's just a matter of making sure we have an understanding of the workflow. So that when we piece it together, it actually makes sense and we can go develop those tools and, and roll them out. Um, on the GNSS correction side, I actually think that's an area that we can add a lot of value, um, especially if you think about, you know, every machine is going to have its own GNSS antennas on there to for tracking and guidance and stuff like that. If you don't have good local corrections, you're not going to get a good data source. If you're doing single base, a lot of times in your mind, the topography can be super extreme. So maybe it's a case where you want to add in something like a VRS system or, or a, a big network adjustment uh, to kind of help with a lot of these other other workflows. So on the on the mobile mapping side, um, it's maybe super complementary to kind of that drone lidar and that INSAR um, satellite data, where the drones can capture the entire mine in the course of a couple of hours, but they're not going to get the same granularity that a mobile mapping system would be able to get, especially when it comes to to tracking minute changes in the haul route. And it might also be a case where we can take the data from the mobile mapping system, and because it's driving by all those benches constantly, we can flag the the areas that are like, okay, this one's under construction. We need to verify for design and, and give that same report for perfect date. So you don't have to go out and set something up because that mobile mapping data is being done constantly. We can just pull those sections in and say, that's how we're going to verify to design and save a bunch of time. Um, still a pipe dream. Uh, all the tools are there, but it's just a matter of, of getting them out there and testing it and making sure that, that it's actually going to work the, the way that we think it does. Um, has anybody tried using a mobile mapper? Um, on on a mine site or outside of mines in general, just any experience with, with mobile mapping. We have the whole innocent mine argument that we can test and mm -hmm. try and use for um, work on the airports mm -hmm. for like crack detection. For the for the runways? Yeah. Unfortunately it doesn't fit into the Trimble workflow because without the MX mobile mapper. You can't use automated crack detection, which is what I was hoping to do. With oh, it. gotcha. <laughs> would that be handheld or would you fly the drone over the runway? Um, <clears throat> so we can mount it to a drone or we could mount it to uh, something on the roof of a truck mm -hmm. and drive. That's the hover map, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have. Oh, okay. Yeah, can it? Those. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, so you have the MSA too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you, so you obviously know the MX product line. Um, I was introduced to it at the Trimble user thing in January. Okay. Would you guys be interested in a demo to see if the use bar solution on the Amazon? Uh, probably not this year. Yeah. <laughs> Getting approval to buy things like this takes a while. Right. And we just bought the Amazon this year, so I doubt it will happen this year. Sure. Uh, you just trade the Amazon. What's that? It's just trading the Amazon. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so the Amazon is the the most mobile lidar you guys have currently yes. at Kennecott, huh? And <clears throat> yeah, the underground they use the Amazon handheld lock ring. Yeah. I right don't do movies down there. So for the haul roads, are do you guys do any kind of? Well, all our work? haul trucks have GPS, so. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday and Wednesday, we do a loading map. We take all the scan data, drone flights, and then all the GPS site files. 
and do a living map every three days and we update the surface and send it out. Oh, wow. So, okay. So wherever a piece of equipment goes, we're taking those, it's like thousand surveyors driving up and down the road every day. So that's how we get the all roads. So you just integrate every data set together and yeah, stitch it on day and just do that and then the last day of the month. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And what do you guys use use that for? Uh, we Besides just condition track. Give it to the uh, engineers, but then most we'll update. Because <laughs> when I first started, we just used topo lines, right? You know? And then what are you doing? So the survey's driving driving the haul road. How are they capturing? Data? It's uh, the haul trucks. Everything has a uh, uh, GPS in it. All our dozers and all that stuff. So all the equipment, all our shovels have yeah, GPSs. Yeah, so we just take that data and then any scans that we've been doing, high wall scans, and then any drone flights, we just put it all into the one map. Yeah, and it's just a living, living thing. Google Earth. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just, that's that's super cool. Yeah. So they take that and do their designs and anything like that. The geotechs do their rockfall analysis and whatever they need to. Just all the up to date data. Yeah. That's wow. I'm old mapper to next. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, I talked to Jess, see if they're that's kind of our research research and development team. They kind of take new technology of try it out and then apply it. Yeah. It's feasible. And Monson's Monson has a demo unit, right? <laughs> right. Uh no, but but we're getting one. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. There you go. We'll have a demo you can see. <laughs> um, again, on the reality capture side, this is maybe the most um, exciting area that Trimble's trying to develop, just in terms of, of what kind of new technology, new resources we're throwing at it. Reality capture has has uh, maybe the largest data sets, just because there's so much different data that goes into the scanning and the mobile mapping and the, the LIDAR and everything like that. And so you can do a lot of interesting things when it comes to feature recognition and auto extraction and, and all those sorts of different um, feature sets. But again, they're all guided by by the real industry workflows. And so it doesn't matter if we have the, the best ideas, and the best tools, we have to back that up with actually what's happening out in the field. So even just understanding what you guys are doing, even, even just the, the few minutes we've been talking is, is super, super helpful. Um, so always be, be, I guess, talking to Monson and these guys and letting them know what you're using those tools for. And maybe it just makes sense to to every so often we're doing a calibration check in and just sit down for a few minutes and talk through what's going on. So we can have a much better understanding of, of what you guys are doing and, and what it's been used for. Any common pain points or, or things that you, you think you need a special tool for. Um, and even if you're starting to use, you know, uh, a competitor of ours because they do something better, you can let us know and we'll we'll do our best to, to keep up and make sure we're still making the best tools. Um, we're also looking at, I guess, potential partnerships on the long range scanning side. So Regal we use for, for all sorts of stuff. Um, and so we're looking at potential um, applications to kind of automate those Regal scanners. Uh, and granted, there's nothing real that's been done yet besides Regal thinks it's a good idea and we think it's a good idea. Um, so again, we're going to need a lot of, of guidance on, on what it's actually used for, um, especially in, in the monitoring world. So trying to like automate a Regal scanner with a total station and with a radar system. And seeing how those data sets can be used together in the way. Um, so we'll probably be reaching out to some of you guys soon for, for beta testing <laughs> if you have any interest in doing stuff like that, even outside of the mining world, right? So if there's gonna be an application for long range scanning for like dam or uh, or bridge monitoring or rail monitoring or something, we can we can always look at something. Um, on the GNSS side, is anybody familiar with with things like VRS networks and, and RTX, RTK corrections? I imagine, yeah, most surveyors are pretty well versed in it. So the, the whole idea with, with something like a, like a pivot system, which is what we use for RTX corrections, it gives you that local network. Uh, Utah runs a network, Nevada runs a network, everybody's got these big VRS networks you can kind of subscribe to. Uh, the advantage to doing it locally is that you'd be able to use your, your local mine grid coordinates. So calibrating from you know, real world coordinates to local grid, and then spitting out VRS corrections on your own um, site coordinates can be really valuable. And then local base stations are always gonna be better than VRS network base stations run by the state, or even as much as Trimble would like to brag that RTX is the best thing ever invented, it's not as good as a local uh, base network. So if there are already, you know, five, six, seven base stations out on the site, it's really not that difficult to set up a
Your voice dropped off. Roland. Troy, you're muted. How about now? We can hear yeah, you again now. now. Okay, sweet. Okay. Where do I that guy? Where did, where did you uh, drop off? <clears throat> can you start off? Can you just from the top? Start, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we lost the last 30 seconds. Awesome. Yeah. So the, the whole idea is that if you have an existing network of base stations and people are subscribing, or not subscribing, but connecting to single base, single base station RTK corrections, it's a fairly straightforward process to add in. Uh, the software is called Pivot, and it takes all those base stations and ties them together into a network correction. And then instead of having to use single base corrections, all of a sudden you're getting multi-base network corrections with a virtual reference station, all based on your local base stations and your local coordinate system. Uh, so it could be a, a huge value add just in terms of having better corrections and easier way to connect. And especially if there's going to be, you know, 10 hall trucks each with, with VRS or, or excuse me, GNSS antennas on there, having VRS up and down that road can be a good way to just get more accurate data on there. And if you already have the hardware, it's a fairly minimal investment to get a computer, throw a pivot on there, get the feeds in there and, and get it up and running. What is your guys' correction source at the, at the pit? Do you know? We have three bases. One's on the MMC base. The other one's on the same site of the Markham shop. Mm -hmm. you know, we have a base station just outside of Hangar. For <clears throat> so are you are you calculating your own network solution or? Because cell cellular data and being able to get online might still be an issue in the some pit. locations up on the stockpiles. We don't have cell service. Yeah. So I think it was trans. You were using UHF as your comms, right? For um, we're we're using a whole the all the tools. Yeah, because uh, we have the uh, region the region network with all the equipment and stuff. So we are using RT RTX on the roll loops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have radio. Yeah, we have all with RTX and. Whatever we need. Well, RTX makes a ton of sense. Yeah, certain areas. Yeah, stuff. So we go through the lines. If we have good connection with the, the base stations, we use that and then go to VRS or whatever and go down the list. Mm -hmm. And all its files, we have the RTX to get what we need. Well, compatibility of all those different datums might be, I guess you guys have figured that all out. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> but we're not a gold mine. So. We're dealing with the uh, 75 ton dippers and stuff. So we're all about quantity, not quality. So just more dirt, faster, move it. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's ascending or left or right. I'm curious yeah. about some of those mines in Northern Nevada, like if they have their own network solution. So, yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. Cool. Something interesting too is, is uh, a lot of times the states will be open to like providing base station feeds because it, it's either a, a free or, or a fairly inexpensive service to get on the VRS networks. So sometimes you can supplement your own own correction with a base fee from the state. So I've seen I've seen a few people use um, like state run base stations as their own monitoring base stations, and then they just run their monitoring servers in there. So it's an interesting way to kind of get you know more information in your system without needing to invest a bunch of hardware. Uh, my my first job at Trimble was in support for monitoring and the the pivot networks because it, it's essentially the same backend software. So, if you guys have questions on VRS stuff, I can I can answer them. <laughs> um, cool. So I'll leave off before we get to get into a software demo. Just in a few notes on on the future of mining, uh, which is a, a big concept, but but maybe worth worth mentioning. So, over the last few months, we've we've been on the road and gone to a bunch of of. Uh, you know, visits like this where we're talking to customers in much different conferences and just trying to learn more about the mining world. Um, I, I went to the School of Mines, so I have a little bit of background in it, but it's been really interesting to kind of be in the world a little bit more embedded and learn uh, what's actually happening on these sites because I think the the one consistent fault for Trimble is that we don't get out in the real world enough. Uh, so trying to just learn from you guys is super, super valuable. Um, 
That being said, Trimble is in mining today, right? So we're all over the place. We have the, the basement rover setups, the machine control, the guidance, the base stations, um, monitoring, mobile mapping, the, the whole gamut. Uh, but there's a lot more work that we can be doing to make sure that your guys' lives are a whole lot easier. Uh, so I do want to share just some incentives, especially on the monitoring side, uh, kind of on the roadmap that we're looking at. So we have today the, the TPC mining and then the triple access mines and tunnels modules that we kind of talked about really guided around a lot of those underground specific workflows. Uh, but the thing that we're still missing is, is a really specific, um, call it like a module in T4D on that monitoring side dedicated to mining. Uh, one of the challenges we've had is that T4D as it is does 99% of what you do for monitoring on mine sites because it does total stations and geotechnical. So the trick for us is really figuring out what, if any, specific deliverables you can get from your monitoring system that you're already doing today that can be easily automated. And there's a lot of value in us adding a feature specific for it. Because we could come in and, and add, you know, uh, specific trending calculations and different reports and different just ways that the data can be displayed. But if you guys aren't using it today, then it's not going to be a real value add. Um, and so we're looking for everybody's feedback in terms of, of what can we do with, with the monitoring data that's going to make it a whole lot more effective. Um, but fall back on perfect dig again. That's a really good example of something that we, we could and should be doing uh, and, and need to invest that time to really understand how we can do it better. Um, so maybe maybe not a need for immediate uh, question and feedback, but keep it in mind as you're using monitoring data. Uh, and I'll, I'll share my contact info and stuff after, after the presentation, but feel free to reach out anytime you guys run into anything that you're seeing. We'll try to add it into to T40. Um, one of the big things we see as a, a big uh, maybe initiative and future kind of roadmap incentive uh, is partnership with, with other companies. And so Trimble isn't going to be able to make things like radar because they're very complicated and expensive and and uh, we'd be playing catch up the entire time in that space. Um, so we we try to work with people in the in the radar space that are leaders. So especially working with somebody like Groundbook who can come in and they can use the Trimble solar station in their system. Uh, they can use the radar system and deliver this almost kind of finished product as a service. So if you guys are out there, you're always working with the same people over and over and over again in the mining space, the tailing space, even in the, the construction and surveying space. Let us know and we'll try to work out, you know, how can we make that partnership more and more effective. Um, our geotechnical uh, portfolio is actually manufactured by World Sensing, who's been a leader in the geotechnical space for a long, long time. Uh, and we saw a big strategic partnership there. So we, we partnered with them as an OEM. So we, we essentially rebrand the World Sensing stuff as a trim equipment, sell it through our distribution. Uh, and support it just like a trimmel piece of equipment, but it's backed up by this this decades of industry experience in the geotechnical space. So it's the the power of Trimble and the way that we can help you guys get geotechnical equipment. We can understand it at a very high level and help you kind of get it out there more effectively. And then we're backed up with the expertise of, of world sensing for the nitty gritty details of data log compatibility and sampling rates and unit conversions and all that that crazy stuff. Same might with the radar, right? So we're not experts in that space. But we know people that are experts, and that's that's as good as us being experts. Um, I also wanted to kind of mention why Trimble is really in that mining space. Um, Trimble's, Trimble's mission has always been to change the way that the world works. Uh, and that's happening kind of quicker and quicker, especially as these environmental, uh, you know, climate change um, and, and different environmental kind of incentives and big political changes are, are happening. Uh, the world is always pushing kind of for that greener future. And mining is a big part of that, right? So as the world electrifies, uh, we get more cars and solar power and, and stuff like that. There's a lot larger need for these, you know, copper and lithium and special metals and stuff like that. So mining plays a really cute, uh, crucial role in the future of, you know, everybody. And so it's really our mission to come in and help you guys be more effective. Um, there's a, a stat that I heard that was like, by 2050, we'll be like 50% uh, behind in production in terms of what we need in terms, or in terms of what we need for an actual green future to cut back on emissions and, and live in the world that everybody says they want to live in. Uh, so to catch up with that, mining needs to be larger, more effective, more, more efficient, and we want to try to help build the tools that will allow you guys get there. Um, our goal is also to kind of do that that digital, the physical, the digital, digital world. Uh, so you kind of think about connecting the the physical and the digital world. So even even matching up the the workflow in the underground mining space where you take the design. Put in TPC, put in terminal access, collecting the field, and then vice versa. Uh, helps you guys do your your live map updates, right? So trying to make the the world digital, but it's easier to interact with, easier to update your designs, and easier to do all these these operations. Uh, another way to think about that is going from that 
design to build to operate and maintain kind of workflow. Where you're taking that design, putting it in the field and building it, and then once it's in the field, you have to maintain and operate it. So all the all the workflows kind of try to match up with that general general theme. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, but but the live map is essentially a, a digital twin, right? That's like the new kind of trendy way to look at, at data capture. Um, so maybe I'll flip this back to to everybody on the call. Like, what data are you using to generate these live maps and these digital twins? You gave us a really good idea already of the GNSS with the, um, the scanning data and everything else that goes into it. Uh, is there anything we missed that's being on the digital twin or live map side? Kind of that, that I guess, real time reality capture, constant update. This is a question for you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Got a bunch of cameras up there too, so we actually <laughs> oh, the engineers don't have to go out of the office. That's the bad thing. But they turn a camera to it. Oh, we looked it at it. Yeah, check. <laughs> yeah, it was you guys have moments where you just you feel like you don't have the sensor or the data in the kind of time that you need it. Well, I know in 2000, I don't know when was it, it was before the slide where Randy Novus, I believe, was working with you guys about putting a uh, a LIDAR unit on each one of our shovels. So it'd be constantly scanning as it digs and then every hour or so we'd do a 360 and scan the whole pit. But I don't know if that ever went anywhere, but they were talking about it. But But yeah, so... Technology is always going, changing and stuff. So it's we're trying to keep up with it and we get the information in the hands that people need to make the decisions. Right. And that's what drones really have helped because with our scanners, it's only line of sight. You can only see what you can see. Mm -hmm. And then DGI's phantoms, you know, we could see on the other side of the berm, two thousand dollars for a little drone and and technology now they have lidar units for them so they're getting better and better and i think our biggest problem is probably data management what do we do with all these gigs and gigs of information and yeah share it fast enough before it's obsolete that seems so, to be the, the trick yeah yeah i was thinking about that when you were talking about your live map i mean this must be terabytes of data well, processed brand new one of the reasons why you have a brand new regional plant. Yeah. What was this like a server room? That well, yeah, just for all the information with the, the just the, uh, it's all the, the monitoring. With, yeah, with the all the haul trucks have GPSs, all the dozers, the shovels. We send in files, all the drills, so drill patterns and the Achille information coming back. So that's. A lot of information, a lot of data going around. Yes, yeah, amazing. So I think I think maybe that highlights one of the potential tools that Trimble can make is, is a way to manage all this data connectivity. Because um, it, it's we've seen it kind of in in the construction space where Trimble's trying to make these these giant platforms to manage all your, your data integration. And Trimble Connect is maybe the the core piece of that. Uh, but trying to work with with obviously data sets are outside of the terminal space because we're not going to be able to do everything. But bring that data together to help you create these these giant models is going to be a, a big, big area I think that we can we can should and could work on. Um, are there other tools that that seem to be missing from the triple portfolio in in the mining space? That's drones. <laughs> If if not, then we'll we'll give you guys a demo for one of everything and get <laughs> <came> on site. <laughs> cool. Um, any other questions before I move on to a little bit of a software demo? So before we we break for lunch and let uh, some of you guys go, I'll I'll go ahead and give you uh, an overview of of. T40 and kind of the big tools that it, that it has and some of the main features. Um, if you guys want to see anything in more detail, feel free to inter interrupt and I'll, I'll spend more time diving into one specific kind of tool set. Uh, but I'll show you kind of T40 web uh, that runs kind of again on top of that, that T40 background. So this is really where all the deliverables come from. Uh, it's where you can interact with that data set and turn the data from your raw 
you know, survey and geotechnical data into something super usable. So the T40 web is hosted essentially as a, a web page, so you can log into it from a web browser. Everybody gets their own account. And so you can you can limit people's access to certain project pages, certain data sets, certain uh, only um, certain roles and permissions. So they can log in and kind of have you know free reign over the entire system, or they're gonna have read-only access and only be able to touch certain things and interact with, with particular features. Um, from a high level, it's probably easiest to start with something like a map view and just get an idea of what the site looks like. This is the, the system that we, that we run in our office in, in Colorado at Westminster. So you can see we have our total station on the uh, southeast corner of the first building. Um, it always takes a little bit longer during the, during the demos. Um, and it's reading, um, you know, total station displacement and also the temperature from that and the, the pressure inside the total station. So you hover your mouse over it and you can see the most up-to-date information. You can also do things like turn on the uh, heat map and the displacement vectors. So especially if you have something like a high wall that's going to have hundreds of prisms on it, just having something as simple as a map view that shows you what direction something's moving in severity can be a huge, huge time saver and a really intuitive way to interact with the data. Um, the, the heat maps will automatically scale to your alarm settings, uh, or you can change that scale and kind of customize it and, and show exactly what you need. You can also do things like overlay um, a geo-referenced image as, as kind of a map layer. And so instead of just having a, a satellite background, you can really easily overlap some of your most recent INSAR data. Uh, or if you have like a topo map or some design data for especially the underground stuff, you can overlay the, the underground features on your map and, and show it essentially in real time on uh, or with your sensors. You can also do things like create specific um, custom views. Um, and the custom views can be either a static image, uh, like this one I saw from Wikipedia and, and dragged and drop some sensors in place on, where it's really similar to the map view, but instead of having you know, a map overlay, it's, it's an actual image. Uh, or this could be a webcam feed. And so you could very easily pull in a webcam feed that's looking at a particular site and then overlay on top of it your prison data or picture. Okay. Um, or uh, up to date charts and then scatter plot on a particular point. So, really easy to make these kind of interactive deliverable. You can also go ahead and integrate multiple um, kind of views into what we call a composite view, which we kind of think about as, as like that command center view. We can have multiple uh, data sets, multiple deliverables. So. Discuss that um, we can have multiple kind of deliverables and visualization features um, on a single view. And then this can be published to an unrestricted URL. So you can just bookmark this to your page or send it out in a big email and say, hey, when you're curious, log in and view it. And you can make as many of these as you want, right? So this could be the webcam feed, chart for the high wall movement and then your IPI data, uh, kind of all in one place. So it makes it really easy to track kind of key assets. And individual teams might only oversee particular structures. So you could have one set up for your tailings, one set up for your slope, one set up for um, other features around the mine site and have a really quick and easy layout. Uh, you can also make any sort of analysis that you want. So you can come in and make something as simple as a display that just shows your prism data. So you can see here we have our prism data overlaid with our alarm status on there. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could add something like the temperature to this mix. Say like, you know, the, the displacement tend to follow the temperature fluctuations daily, uh, especially on structures that aren't just earth and but like a big concrete structure or metal structure. Those change a lot just throughout the day. So overlaying your temperature, especially during like baseline periods, is a really good way to, to show natural movement and explain movements that might happen um, that are unexpected before that, that project even really starts. Uh, you can also integrate multiple data sets, as I said, even tilt, but this one is, is uh, tilt and total station displacement uh, with a trend line on there. So especially for us, we have uh, on the roof, everything's mounted on these big metal columns. And throughout the day, those columns walk around because the sun hits them at different angles and it actually makes a pretty messy setup. Uh, so integrating something like a tilt meter lets you really quickly and easily show, like this is a really quick correlation between the 2D movement and that tilt movement. So as that that beam walks around, you can you can correlate those data sets together. You can also throw in things like the, the trend lines. So especially when the data is a little bit noisy, maybe moving a, a mill or two throughout the day, you can show that trend line on there and say, even though there's a little bit of noise, we're trending in a direction and that direction is is good, bad, severe, getting worse, whatever you need. Um, the trend lines you can use as either a linear regression or like a first, second, third order polynomial. So you can have those kind of fit uh, whatever models you, you have in the system. Uh, the data you can you can have on the analyses is 
essentially anything you need out of the system. So you could do, you could keep it simple and just have your tilt data, your total station data, your piezo data, uh, or you can run separate calculations on your data sets. And you can have your data shown in like velocity or inverse velocity. So if you're handing it over to the slopes team that needs to do more specific calculations, you hand them data that's already kind of pre-done and pre-calculated for them. And then they don't have to do that on their own. They can just get it straight out of T40. Um, if you're working on the tailings group and you're working with a bunch of pizos, you can also overlay you know, your piezometer data with your water temperature data. And you can be very easily added your weather station data to the same chart. So you can have your reservoir level, uh, the water level inside your dam and the rainfall and kind of correlate all those together to single chart and show one kind of cohesive uh, piece. This data set's fairly boring because it's from a, a dam reservoir, which kind of operate at the same level always. Uh, but this is this is piezo data we did from a, a demo system a few months ago. So you can see everything's kind of converted from pressure to, to the actual feet of the water, to the actual elevation of the water that goes through that dam. So there's a, a lot that you can do with the, the data sets. You can also send any data set out as essentially a, a, an automatic report. So you can have them go out. This one went out at 3 o'clock every Monday afternoon. Uh, you can have these go out at 6 a.m. before work starts to all the project managers to say, you know, this data is looking good. Um, go ahead and, and have the trucks run, have the people go in the pit, and everything's okay. Uh, and they can get those reports every day, and even before anything gets severe, they can say, okay, things are getting worse. Maybe later today, we'll have to make some decisions and, and track what's going on. Um, same thing with the alarms. So you can have as many alarms as you need. Uh, uh, and the alarms can be, again, as simple or as complicated as you need, and they can be sent out to whoever needs to get them. So the alarms have the, the capacity to have uh, like an escalating level of, of alert. So the first threshold that is maybe the least severe can go to maybe only the surveyors that say, hey, this prism is moving one expect it. maybe get ready to increase that data frequency or go out there and take a look. Just get ready to understand that things are, are starting to move a little bit more. That next level can go to the, the, the site managers that say, hey, this area is starting to get a little dangerous. And then the third level can go to maybe everybody on site that says, get out of it because things are starting to move and it's kind of at that worst case scenario. So there's a lot that you can do with how those alarms are evaluated and that data comes in. On the accounting side, the system is open in terms of the accounts and how you organize the data and what you want to do with it. So all the alarms, all the reports, all the deliverables, all the charts, there's no extra fees or charges or maintenance required to like keep your reports going. And same thing with the accounts. So you can have as many accounts in the system as you want. Ours has at this point a couple hundred. Uh, you could very easily have you know, an account set up for everybody on the site that needs to get alarms and then have those accounts each with their own roles and permissions. So you can have an, an engineering level account that can come in and do anything to the system. They can change the alarm settings. They can change the reports. Uh, they can make custom calculations and change the way that things are done. You can have people that have uh, what's called analyst access where they can come in and they can make their own set of everything, but those can only be sent out to them. So if they come in and they make a very specific report, they're the only ones that can see that report and receive it, and they're not going to be able to accidentally blast that off to everybody. And same thing with the alarms. They can come in and say, you know, I see that, you know, I have to manage 150 prisms. If a couple of those go offline, I need to know so I can go out and, and you know, clean those prisms and replace them. They can come in and make a, an alarm that says, you know, if these prisms don't have data for the next or for the last day, I want to get an email that says these prisms are offline. Then they go out and they clean them, but they don't want to send that to everybody on the site because nobody needs to know or nobody else really cares about individual prison granularity like that. So having the ability to make those specific alarms and, and configure that logic and have different access levels is, is pretty important. Um, same thing on the project management side. Uh, I don't know if you guys online can see the, the drop down menu here, uh, but it's, it's possible to run a lot of different project sites in a single instance of T40. So that could be running multiple mine sites in a single yeah. installation of T40, or it could be splitting out your projects and your project management so that you have you know, a project for your tailings dam, a project for your high wall, and a project for your underground. And all those data sets are bespoke and have different users with them. So you're not having one big T40 instance with a million different data sets. Each team has their own specific project site that's configured with their accounts and their settings, their alarms, and, and whatever it might be. Uh, any questions on, on the main features of T40? There's a million different things that you can do with it. Uh, but those are kind of the, the big, big things. Oh, you want me to take care of it? Not today. Not today. Maybe not.